Okay. Let's see, we're waiting for two Steve's. There's one Steve. We ready to start? Yeah. Okay. I think so. Okay, it's 6.30 p.m. I would like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of May 23rd, 2022. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate the Zoom meeting process. Council members and city staff are participating from remote locations, and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those who wish to speak during the meeting should follow the instructions at malibucity.org slash virtual meeting. Please make sure you visit malibucity.org slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called. So you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Council members, if you have comments to make during this meeting, please raise your hand and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the re re record and for the public. May I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Fair? Here. Councilmember Pearson? Here. Councilmember Uring? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Will you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. May I have a closed session report, please? Yes, Council Member Fair and members of the council, good evening. The council did receive an update tonight on the school separation uh, school separation issue and the negotiations with the Santa Monica Unified School District. Um, as most of you know, we've been engaged in mediation with the district. And uh, at this point, Ms. Wood, who's representing the city from a legal standpoint, is very encouraged with the status of the negotiations that are occurring in uh, the mediation. Um, those mediation discussions are confidential and cannot be disclosed uh, to date if and when a resolution is reached that would be brought back to the council in open session for the community to comment. So that would conclude my report. Okay. Thank you, John. May I have an approval of the agenda, please? I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. I'll second. Roll call vote, please. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, we do not have any ceremonial presentations, so we will move on to and item. Fair, yes? if I could give you a brief report on the posting of the oh, agenda as excuse well. me. Thank you. The Kelsey. agenda for this meeting was properly posted on May 13th, 2022. Thank you, Kelsey. All right, moving on to item 2A, written and oral communication from the public. Do we have any public comments on items not on the agenda? Yes, you have five speakers signed up. They are Craig Hill, Lloyd Ahern, Burt Ross, Pamela Conley-Ulick, and Scott Dietrich. We'll hear from Craig Hill first. Hey, good evening, council and staff. A couple of things quickly. I had some follow-up on the towing of unsafely parked cars with Mayor Grisanti and also with Steve McClary and Susan Duenas. Council, you didn't address what happens in Eastern Malibu. It turns out that the ad hoc plan is to tow those unsafe cars also to Heather Cliff. So supposedly it would take too long to tow from the west to a central location, yet somehow not from further east to the west. Since we uh, don't have data on how many tows are needed in Eastern Malibu versus Western, we don't have a clear idea of how the Heather Cliff plan will work. At least staff is now aware that better data is needed. Hopefully the city and sheriff will work together to standardize data collection, measuring variables consistently, and that when the trial period is over, staff can produce a report with solid facts in which to base a more permanent towing plan. 
Second, I'm disappointed that the Planning Commission was offered only a single date for a meeting on the high school, knowing that that's the one day I have to be out of town. Apparently, this is because the school district is rushing the city and the city seemed disinclined to stand up to them. Not scheduling the item for the whole commission raises due process concerns, which leads to the question of how seriously the city takes the commission's role. I wrote to you regarding a statutory stipend. I'll briefly mention it here. It's, it's a subset of this more general issue. Plus, I have to leave in a moment for the best appointment I could get for my fourth jab. So I just wanted to say, yes, it's an honor to serve voluntarily, but when we're required to pay for the privilege by absorbing city expenses, that implies a council that doesn't fully value its commission. We're not just advisors. In our quasi-judicial role, we conduct official city business. So the question is, do you really value the role that the commission plays, regulating growth, et cetera, or would you be just as happy allowing development to proceed willy-nilly? In 2019, I informed that council that general law cities such as Malibu provide for a stipend. The reply then, reasonably enough, was that implementation should be considered when the budget was not as stressed as it was then. That moment is now, not least because of the increasing price of gas for site visits and soon more trips to city hall for hybrid meetings, hopefully. Most cities implement the provision, including the other COG cities, which compensate commissioners up to $100 per meeting. And in my semi-random sample of beach cities, Laguna pays 392 per month and Dana Point pays $1,100 per month. So 100 per meeting would put us on par with COG cities and in the lower range of beach cities. Now, if five commissioners accepted the stipend, it would total about $12,000 for the year. That's a tiny dent for the city, but a saving grace for those of us currently out of pocket. Plus, wealthy commissioners might decline it, so the actual line item might turn out to be substantially less. You're contemplating raises for employees, justifiably, you care about their quality of life, so too should you care about your commissioners at a nominal level, only about one thirteenth of what you get. Please let us serve with the dignity that comes with knowing our role is taken seriously. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lloyd Ahern, followed by Bert Ross, Pamela Conley-Ulick, and Scott Dietrich. Uh, good evening, City Council. My name is Lloyd Ahern, and I'm going to speak to you tonight about Smart Coast. It is a, a organization that was um, been formed to deal with the Coastal Commission and the Coastal Commission to deal with the cities. It, um, I'm the representative from Malibu to um, the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, so I thought it'd be a good idea if I went to this. It was a, a hotel in Long Beach. Um, last week. And I want to tell you, I was so impressed with how many planning departments, mayors, uh, geologists from all of the beach cities, from San Diego to, to San Francisco, there was just an immense amount of cities that are coastal cities that were representative. And I know Paul is aware of this. I know he's not there tonight. I just want to just say out loud so that we so that Paul and maybe myself and um, Richard can get together in the future and talk about how we can really get involved with this co this group called Smart Coast. I walked into this meeting at 7.30, 7.45 in the morning and I'm sitting down, I'm looking across the table and I go, you know, that guy looks awfully familiar to me. It was Jack Ainsworth the executive director of the California Coastal Commission. And he was sitting there and he never ever took his eyes off of the dais or off of the map. He watched from 7.30 in the morning till 4.30 that afternoon. And when you gotta sit and listen, you can't speak, you really learn something. Cause I watched this guy pay attention to a lot of different viewpoints. And I think that the attitude of this group, back to the Coastal Commission was there, the Attorney General's office was there, uh, parts of other organizations that were, um, that were government were there, that were not just, you know, the, the cities. We really have got to get our, Richard and a, and a group of our planning department into this group and figure out how we can deal with this this um, rising tide problem that's going to be haunting us for quite a while and get ourselves right in the thick of making a plan for the future. Thank you. 
Our next speaker is Bert Ross, followed by Pamela conley ulick Scott Dietrich, and Norm Haney. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, Bert, I think you were just muted again. Bert, I'm asked. There you go. Okay. Sorry, my comments are, are being addressed to uh, Councilman Silverstein, who uh, unfortunately is not in attendance. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein, what possessed you to use the F word, the F word, when addressing members of the LA County Board of Supervisors? Have you completely lost it? Roughly a year ago, I wrote an op-ed piece stating that you cannot control your behavior. Are you trying to prove me right? In your own defense, you said that you were speaking as a private citizen, but then why did you introduce yourself as Malibu's mayor pro tem. How could you possibly be speaking as a private citizen when the issue you are addressing is a public matter impacting our city? And even if you weren't speaking as a private citizen, how could you possibly think it appropriate or helpful for a private citizen to curse at elected officials during a public meeting? This is not, as you will try to make it, an issue of free speech, but rather whether you have the ability to disagree without being disrespectful. Bruce, of course, you have the constitutional right to be rude and belligerent toward the supervisors, but such tactics seem counterproductive to me. I found your written pre presentation to the supervisors well thought out and share your frustration with their position, but I don't see how insulting people whose support we need can conceivably help our cause. By using profanity and addressing the County Board of Supervisors, you not only show disrespect for the institution and the supervisors, you also attack the very people who support the city of Malibu needs. In all your years as a member of the Delaware Bar, did you ever address a judge by saying, as you did to the supervisors, what the F are you thinking? Of course you did not, because had you, you would have been held in contempt and suffered disciplinary action by the Bar Association. Nevertheless, now you apparently cannot differentiate between passionate advocacy and egregious, immature, and extremely disrespectful behavior and in this case, behavior, which can only damage our relationship with the county whose cooperation is vitally necessary. You have been a litigator for virtually your entire adult life. Surely you have the ability to make a point persuasively without profanity. Councilman Silverstein, on a number of occasions, you have defended yourself by declaring that you have not done anything unlawful. Several months ago, when I asked you on next door whether public officials should be held to a higher standard than simply not breaking the law, you shockingly responded by saying no. You need to understand that whether or not you, as an elected official, hold yourself to a higher standard than that, the public will. A recent report found that your conduct at City Hall was hostile and unprofessional. Rather than learning from this experience, you continue to attack others, including people whose support you seek in a hostile and unprofessional manner. It is precisely because of this kind of inexcusable behavior that you have been denied the mayoralty on two occasions. Unfortunately, you have learned nothing. Thank you. Our next speaker is Pamela conley ulick followed by Scott Dietrich and Norm Haney. Good evening, uh, city council members. I'm grateful that you're serving and your sacrifices that you all make for being here and for holding yourselves uh, accountable to your neighbors and for acting in for the good of all of us. I wanted to ask you, Sherry Lata, who ran CCW for 40 years, has been forced to leave our city thanks to SMMUSD. And um, her last days coming up, I just heard they were able to give an extension so she can have the preschoolers graduate on June 10th. But I would ask that this city really, like they did with the labor exchange la last week, honor her, um, for her service to our children, to our community, where our kids are now growing up and soon they'll be on the city council dais. And this, the lessons they learned at CCW and how, like Bruce said or, or earlier, um, Bert Ross, excuse me, how to agree to disagree and you can still be agreeable. And that's a really important lesson and maybe a lot of people are not blessed enough to have a CCW and a preschool 
that teaches you those great skills. And so I'm really asking you, city council members, I know that you approved the, the tow yard last week. I wish it could have, at Heathercliff, I wish it could have been more creative to help this CCW as a, as a nonprofit that serves our community, especially with education. I know there's funding later on tonight, you're gonna look at library services, but I wish it could have been creative with helping educate our youngest children in our society and that's those attending the ccw and maybe uh, i'm imploring all of you karen you're an advocate for children and mikey um, and uh, paul and all of you steve if you could maybe think of ways that you could help these types of organizations like ccw that are serving and are so important to teach the children how to be good neighbors and how to be okay with disagreeing and how to play in a sandbox, basically, I guess is what it comes down to and treat others like we would want to be treated. Um, so thank you again for your service. I'm hopeful you could do something before she leaves. I don't know your next city council meeting might be after that date, but maybe you can do it after uh, CCW is closed down after those 40 years. Thank you again for your service. Uh, we do all appreciate your, the hard work you're doing here. And um, even if we disagree on things like the tow yard, I, I look forward to seeing you and, and uh, working with you to make our community better tomorrow than it is today. Thanks. Our next speaker would be Scott Dietrich, but I don't see him in the meeting yet. So we'll try to circle back later and we'll hear from Norm Haney followed by Ryan. Uh, good evening, Honorable uh, uh, Norm, we're having trouble hearing you with your connection. Um, I was also a smart uh, seminar that was held the recent night, and the meeting started as it looks like Norm was disconnected from the meeting, so we'll try to circle back to him as well, and we'll hear from Ryan next. And Councilmember Fair, I'm not seeing Scott Dietrich, Ryan, or Norm. Uh, Norm actually just rejoined the meeting, so maybe we can hear his comments now. Norm, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. But um, the meeting was on how to deal with sea level curves. This is ridiculous. And Norm's not working. Yeah, I can't hear him. Elsie, maybe we should move on and uh, just yeah. circle back with Norm one more time, perhaps. Okay, would you like to come back to this maybe after the city manager update? Uh, yeah. Sure, that's fine. Okay, and I don't see our other speakers in the meeting, so that concludes public comment for the moment. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, moving on to item 2B. Uh, I don't know if we have any commission or committee reports, uh, and if not, we will have the city manager update. We don't have any commission signups. Jennifer C2 is in the meeting, Karen. Uh, Captain C2, welcome. We we welcome uh, any update from you. Karen. Steve, thanks for pointing that out. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be back and work with each one of you again. And um, yeah, just happy to be here and looking forward to meeting with each of you to understand what's changed the last couple of years and <laughs> see what we can do to partner together. And um, I know uh, Lieutenant Waters is on the call as well. And um, I know he's been doing a great job um, and he, uh, working with Malibu. So if there's anything that we can do for you, please, you guys all have my phone number. Happy to work with you. It's great working with um, Steve. So I appreciate it. Thank you, Captain C2. And Lieutenant Waters, uh, do you have any uh, update for us? Yeah, I just want to address some of the issues that are occurring down in your area. Um, it looks like our vehicle burglaries are up slightly, which uh, we already had a feeling we're gonna, was going to be happening. We ran a, an operation last week. It didn't yield very, very good results, but the weather wasn't very good either. So we're going to do another operation like that in the coming weeks. Uh, so look, look for that to be going to uh, ha happening. Um, as far as aggravated assaults, completely down just one domestic violence incident and uh, two Resbergs, but they were, they, they look to be, uh, only one of them looks to be an unknown suspect. As far as some of the trending crimes around the county area, none of those have seemed to seep into uh, the city of Malibu yet, which is really good. We're doing a good job of keeping uh, front porch clean and making sure they don't come through. Um, sites are uh, at for year to date, 2419 total citations, 1156, uh, just for last month. So doing really good at keeping the speed down and the collisions are down this month too. So all in all, that's a good report for this month. Uh, look forward to doing some more work with you guys and for the beach team starting to ramp up. You'll have a lot of extra patrol out there. Um, and Having a lot of fun so far talking about the new station that's getting ready to get built. So and it's almost uh, in its final stages. So a lot of exciting things happening with us and especially having Captain C2 here. She's a forward thinker. So we're going to be looking at a lot of new projects and hopefully anything you guys have come to us and we will help you with. All right. Thank you very much, Lieutenant. I appreciate that very much. Welcome back, Captain C2. And uh, good news on um, some of our incidents going down. And yes, uh, happy to hear the beach team is getting ready to kick into action for the summer. Okay, uh, if council members don't have any questions, we will move on to the city manager's update. Okay. Thank you, um, council member Fair, members of the council. Happy to give you my report this evening. Uh, we are keeping a close eye on what is happening uh, with the drought and water restrictions across the state. I think as many you are aware, uh, metropolitan water, uh, which supplies water to many areas in Southern California, but not to Malibu, uh, and they do also supply LA, um, just announced water restrictions for their customers starting June 1st, limiting outdoor water, watering to one day per week. Of course, we in Malibu are part of uh, Water District 29, uh, which obtains its water from the West Basin, and it, and that potable water comes from the Colorado River. Uh, surprisingly, there is no mandatory water conservation uh, through the West Basin right now and from the Cal Colorado River water source. Uh, West Basin has implemented a 30% voluntary water usage reduction from its customers, but nothing mandatory at this point. Uh, Water District 29 has stated that the Colorado River source is not currently in an emergency situation and may not go into a mandatory usage reduction. However, that may change if the drought continues within the next year or so. Uh, and if I was a betting man, I would bet that the drought will probably continue. 
Um, so at this time, there are no mandatory water restrictions. Uh, it'd be a good time though for folks to start planning for that or to start taking steps to voluntarily re reduce their water if they can. Uh, and uh, again, the restrictions, you know, the, the non-restrictions may change uh, depending on what happens. I know that the Governor Newsom uh, met today with uh, many uh, water district leaders in Southern California. I did not hear any direct outcome out of that meeting, uh, but he is trying to encourage them to take steps to uh, voluntarily reduce water locally. And they plan to get together again in a couple of months uh, to see how those efforts are doing. Um, so stay tuned on that. Also want to report on a couple of things related to code enforcement. Uh, they have been, our code enforcement staff has been very busy out there. And I know we don't often report out some of the activities um, that they have undertaken, but just wanted to report that we had received a number of complaints regarding uh, leaf blowers uh, and the code staff wrote 28 citations uh, in the month of May for illegal use of leaf blowers. Also on a report, I think it might be worth noting that uh, Right now we have uh, 213 issued short-term rental permits with approximately 60 pending. Um, moving on, we keep thinking that we're gonna be maybe getting out of the woods with COVID. And um, while the numbers are not spiking, uh, they are not looking good uh, in terms of the number of new cases, which are up, um, testing rate, the testing positivity rate is also up, as well as the number of hospitalizations. Uh, fortunately, the deaths remain relatively flat or declining. Uh, on May 20th, the county announced uh, that due to worksite outbreaks and increasing positive cases, that they are going to continue requiring masking on public transportation, and they're urging employers to take appropriate safety measures to protect their workers and customers. Um, just one interesting stat that I'd like to point along, uh, they have a number of early alert metrics that they use to try to watch for outbreaks, uh, and they recently reported 227 worksite, worksite cluster outbreaks in Los Angeles County between May 11th and May 17th, and that is a increase of sixfold uh, from reported just a month ago. So definitely seeing some increased concerns on the COVID front. Also wanted to report that I did have a meeting uh, with our uh, new captain, police captain, Jennifer C2 last week. So um, very eager to, to uh, hear what her plans are to address uh, the, the concerns for the Malibu area. Also wanted to report that I'm uh, pleased to announce that uh, Joe Tony, our new assistant city manager, uh, began last week. So there he is. Hi, Joe. And uh, I'll go to you. Joe, would you like to say a few words since we have you on camera? Sure. Might as well. Uh, impromptu speech, right? Uh, thank you, Steve and, and council members. I'm happy to be here. Um, looking forward to supporting you and the city team to help serve our community and implement this council's policy directive. So, so thank you. Thank you, Joe, you passed the pop quiz test, thank you. <laughs> also wanted to report to council that I attended uh, the meeting of the um, uh, Council of Governments last week, uh, and also a meeting um, that we've been having uh, every couple of months uh, with the representatives to talk about plans for the new Malibu police station. Uh, we are continuing to develop um, those models and we'll be bringing those to council uh, at an unspecified date, but we're getting closer on that. That is my report and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Steve, and welcome. Joe, we all look forward to meeting you in person or maybe on Zoom. Um, let's see, does anyone have any questions for City Manager McClary on that report? Okay, thank you. All right, uh, we will move on to item 2C. City Council subcommittee reports. Uh, Mikey or Steve, who'd like to go first? Steve? Yeah, I'll take a run at it. Uh, Captain Seidel, good to have you back. Um, 
Chris, I haven't seen Chris Frost this happy in a long time. So um, this is good. And Lieutenant Waters, uh, the work you're doing on the speeding and the car shows on Sunday is having an impact. I live right above the Civic Center and the amount of car, I mean, there's still some guys speeding up and down, but it has been reduced dramatically. So thank you very much for that effort. Uh, I attended a couple of meetings last week. There was a, a Clean Power Alliance meeting where they were working on their pricing and, and looking at what California Edison was doing. And I think what they're going to try and do is come up with a pricing model that allows them to significantly stre strengthen their financial position, which I think is an excellent idea. Uh, we had an administrative and finance committee where Mike and I were able to sort of finalize the general fund grants. And then uh, today we had an environmental and sustainability meeting. And uh, I hope you'll, uh, Yolanda, I think Yolanda said she was going to post it on the website, and I certainly hope she did. If, if you haven't listened to one of those meetings, you ought to, this is one you ought to pay attention to. The amount of work that is going on in this city, uh, trying to protect our environment and doing the right thing is absolutely amazing. I mean, when you see the list of stuff that these folks have done, uh, and the effort they're putting in with a small staff. Uh, it, it's almost like some of it's got to be magic. Uh, I think you will be impressed and, and really get a sense of, you know, what our staff can do and how much how much they're really working to try and make Malibu the place we want it to be. So with that, if you can see that, on your, if it gets posted to the website, please take a look. Yolanda, thank you and your staff for the work you're doing. Uh, and that's all I got today. Thank you, Stephen. Just to say that uh, it, it is posted on the website already, on the environmental website. Cool. All right. Thank you, Steve. Mikey? Boom. Just, just, Yolanda is just on it like that. Um, well, Steve covered uh, all of our hanging out for the last week or two. Um, ANF, um, Environmental Sustainability Meeting. Once again, it is mind blowing how much you guys get done. Um, and we'll miss Christine greatly. Um, amazing member of the team. Sorry to see her moving on. Um, great to see Captain C2 and uh, Lieutenant Waters. Great team. Really excited about that. Um, so thanks. And, and thanks to uh, Councilman Uring for uh, taking the CPA meeting. They are great. They're excellent meetings. And um, sounds like you enjoyed that one. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, public speakers. Um, Yeah, the towing situation is not perfect. Craig, I agree with you completely if you're still here. Well, there you are. I haven't got the shot yet, I guess. Um, it's a work, a major work in progress. Um, as to uh, as to the meeting, it's the first I've heard of that in the high school. And uh, dollars to the planning commission. I wish uh, we brought this up sooner, but there you go. That's how that is. Lloyd on Smart Coast, I agree. I'm, I was very sorry to miss the event. I just didn't fit my schedule, unfortunately. Great organization. We need to be a part of it. And I know Paul is not only he is a part of it, so I know we're in good hands there. I'm glad to hear about the great turnout. Um, and yes, uh, Joe is definitely pays a lot of attention. I'll, I'll agree with that in a heartbeat. Um, Pamela, uh, I can tell you that Karen and I worked long and hard with Sherry over quite a period of time to try and help her figure this out. Came close to having something, but it didn't quite work out. So it's been a long journey. My, my kids are graduates of CCW. Love her, and I agree she needs to be honored. And, um, and she's been an amazing gem to this community for so long and made the difference in so many people's lives so many families' lives. Um, and uh, and Mr. McClary, City Manager McClary, that is mind-blowing. There's no drought restrictions that way. That caught me off guard. I just saw an article in the LA Times on the Colorado River, and it looked like a little stream. So I'm a little confused on that one. But um, yeah, that's, that's crazy. That's unbelievable. And yes, I'm well aware code enforcement is historically busy and uh something we talked about a little bit today earlier so the only other thing i'll add and then i'm done is um on friday i got two i was a panelist speaker at the united states uh green building 
um, council, um, their conference there, they had a, asked me to join a panel on fire resiliency. And uh, really with the focus was, was on the home, the last, the last ground zero on where you need to protect. So if you're listening to this and you haven't hardened your home, well, me and every real expert on that panel would tell you that you got to harden your home. It is, the, it is ground zero on stopping your home from burning down. Um, fire will come eventually, and every expert seems to completely agree on that. More to, more to go on that. It's a long-term thing to, to overcome. I'm glad the new houses in Malibu are so much more resilient. I still worry very much about the older homes. And those are my comments for now. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mikey. Um, let's see, I too would like to address some of the public speakers. Again, uh, welcome, welcome back, Captain C2. Uh, and uh, Lieutenant Waters, I just want to thank you for the work you do here. Um, and it's noteworthy that uh, crime is for the most part down. Uh, and uh, thank you for everything that you and your team do in that regard. Um, regarding the tow yard, uh, I think as everybody knows what's happening uh, for this summer is uh, just for this season, it will end in October. I think it will be a good time to uh, evaluate how it's working and uh, look at other options in the future. So, um, you know, that's, that's the opportunity we have starting, uh, I guess, next weekend. Um, to Lloyd Ahern and the little bit that we were able to hear from Norm Haney, thank you for attending Smart Coast California. And yes, uh, our mayor, Paul Grisanti, I believe is on the board of the Smart Coast group. Sea level rise is not going away. So I agree. Um, I'd like to see us be more part of that team, uh, learn more from that group and be in the room with people like Jack Ainsworth and uh, the other elected officials that were there. Um, there's, there's, that can only, that can only help. I don't see any harm coming from that. Um, yeah, Pamela, you look, as Mikey said, he and I have spent a lot of time uh, trying to help uh, Sherry Lotta figure something out with CCW. That is tough. Um, and I'm not entirely sure at this moment if the school is closing or if she's still looking to relocate. But um, I'm sure with one phone call tomorrow, I can get the update on that. Um, and uh, City Manager McClary, uh, I realize we don't have mandatory water restrictions right now uh, with uh, being part of Water District 29, but I will reiterate what you said, West Basin is asking for a 30% voluntary water reduction. I think that's something everybody can aim toward. I hope people will take that to heart. Um, and the fact that COVID cases are up, I guess, is uh, just uh, affirmation that we're doing the right thing by going back to remote meetings. Um, as far as my uh, meeting participation, oh, a, a city man, a, a assistant city manager, uh, Joe Tony, I look very much forward to meeting you. Uh, in the last two weeks, I attended the Contract Cities annual municipal seminar. Uh, I think it's worth noting that Contract Cities' motto is strength through collaboration. Um, and that's what they're all about. The presentations I attended included a panel discussion uh, with two of the county supervisors, uh, Janice Hahn and Catherine Barger, along with somebody from uh, a Ventura County supervisor and a council member from one of the Riverside County uh, cities. Uh, there was a presentation from LA County Public Works on water and infrastructure. There was a presentation uh, from first responders, including LA County Fire and Sheriff's Departments. There was a section on housing, and there was a section on workforce development and retention, something that we've definitely discussed here as a city. Uh, May 17th, I attended the monthly Las Virginas Malibu COG meeting. May 18th, I attended the County Library Commission meeting. And, um, and that's it for my meeting attendance. So we can move on now 
to um, consent calendar. Uh, item three, do we have any items pulled from the consent calendar by the public or uh, the council? We do have items pulled, but I did want to check, Councilmember Ferrer, did you want to try to revisit the speakers who had issues connecting earlier? Okay, I see Scott Dietrich has his hand. I mean, we do we do ask people to be present when their names are called. Uh, I will make an exception this time. Scott Dietrich, uh, please uh, make your public comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Karen. Um, I just wanted to uh, make it uh, an announcement that the CERT team in conjunction with the city of Malibu is having a safety expo on June 4th and uh, it's on the city website and this is a great event it's going to take over the entire city hall including the parking lot and there's a whole number of uh, booths and vendors coming and learn about safety because this is what Malibu is all about. Um, that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, yes. Last year, uh, I, I was surprised to not see more people there. Um, so I Last hope everybody was very small. Yeah, I this hope... year we're, we're going back because we can do in person. Um, yeah, last year was in person uh, in the back of City Hall, but uh, I hope uh, that with this publicity uh, plug and, and others to come, we'll get a lot better uh, participation this year. Okay, so thank and you, Scott. Councilmember Fair, would you like to see if Norm Haney has improved his connection? Oh, sure. Thank you. Again, I apologize for my computer, um, council members. Um, I do agree that we should get very much involved in the uh, Smart Coast organization. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. I was there the entire uh, seminar. Um, I would like to speak on item 5A. And with that, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Norm. It and looks like we yeah, do sorry. also have Ryan present now. Oh, okay, thank you. I'd like to finish up public comment. Uh, thank you. I think there were some computer problems that all three of us were not able to to get into this meeting. Um, I wanted to say that I think the city needs to follow up on my prior suggestion of engaging a professional grant writer because there's you know when the state's flush with money, that's when grants can be had more easily. And also uh, considering for that position a, a capital campaign fundraising person. If the city has some cash, now might be a time to explore further land acquisition. I know you're probably going to start thinking, oh my God, we just bought a bunch of land. Well, it's, it's not going to be going down in price. And I have some ideas of, of how we might get land at less than you know, the full value. And I think you probably know what they are already. But the idea that we already have certificates of participation out on other land, I think those certificates are at fairly competitive and low interest rates. And if we send out for certificates into the future, um, then we're probably going to have to pay higher percentage rates. So if you have the cash, now might be the time to think of making a move. Um, I want to move on to the next item is we're stuck in a memorandum of understanding with Caltrans on paying their bills for um, maintenance, repairs, and even the electricity to operate traffic signals on the state highway. And there are a couple of improvements and signals that got pushed down our throats. And I think you know exactly which ones we're talking about. And one of them is even being considered to be upgraded from an electrified crosswalk to now a full signal where all the traffic is going to have to stop and the whole bit. We should not be consenting to fund these mistakes and signals and problems that we did not agree to and that we protested. Um, this is an optional agreement. It should come back and make sure that we don't have listed those signals, which, you know, we didn't want to do, we're not a part of, we didn't pay for, uh, because we're beyond obligated for their replacement cost in the future and for upgrades. 
the replacement and upgrades got thrown in um, when the uh, thing got amended. Uh, it just got thrown in and I spoke to it and they said, oh, what's well, a standard thing? And I go, it's not standard. It wasn't in there before. It's a total change and it's going to come back to cost the city a bunch of money. The last is um, you have um, an audit listed under the uh, warrant register, which I put in to speak to, but I'll just mention it now that I have time or you could just let my time run an extra minute. And that was that there was a specific audit performed by Lance and Stoll and Lundstrom for, I want to know if that was a performance audit or a financial audit. And if it was, what was the specific audit for? Are Brian, we auditing? That's your time. And Councilmember Fair, in this continued public comment, I am seeing a raised hand from Keon Schulman as well. Okay, uh, I think after that, we'll have to conclude public comment. Um, as we said, uh, people typically sign up uh, before the meeting uh, and then, or at least before this item. And um, oh, uh, this is just for, this is just for your benefit. Uh, this is Joel, of course. Okay, thank you, Joel. Um, please put the phone number for the Zoom call-in, ordinary phone number prominently on the virtual meeting page that solves the problem of people having bad connections like norm they could just make an ordinary phone call and also for people who don't have an internet connection at the moment and just want to participate by phone without their computer that's what a normal zoom call usually consists of i don't know uh, why you guys set it up mistakenly without the zoom phone call number please put it there thank you okay thank you very much joel Okay, I believe that concludes public comment. Let's move on to the consent calendar, item three, and I believe we have some items pulled, Kelsey? Yes, item 3B2 and item 3B12 have been pulled by the public. Okay, in that case, is there a motion to, oh, do we have any uh, council, member, uh, council members pulling any consent items? No. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar pulling items 3B2 and 3B12? I'll make a motion um, to approve the consent calendar pulling. Now you got to remind me. Sorry. 3B2 and 3B12. 3B2 and 3B12. I'll second. Thank you. Roll call, please. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uri? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Uh, item 3B2, uh, may we please have a staff report? The warrant register. This is a, a good evening, <laughs> council members and city manager. Um, the warrant register is a um, is a consent calendar item. It is a routine um, uh, item and and so staff does did not have a report prepared of course we'd be happy to answer any questions for instance the last one that i just heard um uh, by our speaker in um unscheduled oral communications uh has to do with a payment to our independent financial services financial auditors excuse me financial statement auditors and it was for the completion of the single audit which is a supplement to our typical annual financial statements. The single audit is specifically for a schedule of state and federal awards over a certain amount of, um, ref of funds and then uh, uh, cycled through every few years. Um, that is, I just did a quick look to double check that in fact, um, that was for the uh, completion of the single audit. Okay, thank you very much, Ruthie. Uh, and do we have any public speakers on that item? Ryan is the only speaker on this item, so we'll okay. see if he has any more questions. Um, that that pretty much covered it. I, I wanted to say that, um, though, in general, if the warrant register practice and why this city pays the pays the checks out and then reports to you later, uh, rather than getting approval to release the payments, and maybe you could. Uh, get an answer on that or why we're not doing it that way. And uh, 
the second was it seems that a lot of people are being paid in personal name rather than business, even though I know I recognize the names as being owners of businesses that use their business names and so forth. And not just this register, but others preceding it, uh, like for sewer pumping, like why we're paying the owner of the, the pumping company in a personal name, or we've paid the personal owner of the um, company that has the road maintenance service contract with the city. And then we are paying them both ways personally, and then as the company for work that's done here, it just seems odd. Um, so then the last would be is on small contracts, um, like you, you personally paid some guy to come replace the ceiling panels, I guess, in the planning department and paid him $1,600. I don't know how that goes if, if that was the correct rate for and even why it was even needing to be done. Um, but if we if we had it we had a janitorial company already uh, that's been doing maintenance at City Hall, changing light bulbs. Maybe they could change a ceiling panel. So I'm just wondering why that was a separate contract and, and sixteen hundred dollars. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. And that okay. concludes public comment. Okay, moving on to item three B twelve. Uh, do we have a Mr. financial? Uh, Does the council me? want to take action on item 3B2? Oh, excuse me. I'll, I'll move item 3B2. I will second. I, okay, roll call, please. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item 3B12, fiscal year 2021-22, third quarter financial report. Uh, do we have a staff report, please? Again, um, good evening again. And this was an, an item that was pulled from the, a member of the public. And so we do not have a report prepared. Thank you, Ruthie. And uh, Kelsey, do we have uh, any public comments? Yes, we have Ryan signed up for this item. He is our only speaker. I wanted maybe Ruthie could just comment in general as far as the uh, projected tax revenues for the quarter, if the amounts received were greater than projected or less. And if so, maybe why, if it's the sales tax on gasoline, you know, jumped up. And so we got more tax coming in, for instance, or you got a bunch more, um, uh, bed and breakfasts or uh, short-term rentals uh, paying in as to where we are with this quarter. I know that you've got a budget item coming up, but I wanted to know for this collections for revenue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is it uh, council's pleasure that I, I uh, provide a quick response or would you like for me to, uh, yes, okay. Uh, so uh, yes, our third quarter um, report was prepared. Um, the timing of it is a little curious. It just, we were not quite in receipt of all of those, an update for all of those um, revenue items. And even in fact, uh, in the budget item, as was mentioned, I do, I did in the staff report make a comment that in certain areas we, um, we have outperformed, we have collected a little more more uh, than what was um, budgeted. However, we did uh, address um, the first two quarters and the first two quarters with the mid-year report, uh, the trend that was increasing. And so we did uh, recognize that we would um, project a little more in various revenue categories. And thankfully we are performing well against those projections. Just last week, we got um, a complete report on our sales tax um, uh, information for the last reporting period, which was good news. And in fact, even the timing of that meeting uh, was not in time to make it into the staff report uh, with the budget. So I'll be making a, a brief comment about that during that presentation as well. But uh, so far, so good. Unfortunately, we do uh, anticipate we see many economic sign, uh, signs of economic downturn and, uh, you know, again, uh, proceed very cautiously as the council um, typically does. So that would be my advice on that. Thank you. Thank you, Ruthie. Okay, do we have uh, a motion on item 3B12? I'll move item 3B12. I will second. Okay, roll call, please. Councilmember Yuri? Yes. Councilman Pearson? Yes. Councilman Fair? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. All right, moving on. 
to item 4A, uh, proposed budget for fiscal year 2022-23. May we have a staff report, please? Yes, good evening, council members. Again, it is our pleasure to present for your consideration the proposed budget and annual work plan for next year at this evening's public hearing meeting. Um, I will be uh, covering the uh, next slide, please. So sorry. I'll be covering the items that are listed here, and I am joined tonight by the full team, um, as was uh, present for our previous two meetings on the budget. Um, I also uh, would like to take an opportunity to welcome our new permanent assistant city manager, Joe Tony. I know um, the city manager introduced him a moment ago, but very excited to have him join the team, and, um, and I know that you will be very excited too, very pleased. So in a few slides, I'll hand the presentation over to department uh, um, heads for their overviews, um, and then I'll continue with the final summary um, of our next steps. But first, I'd like to hand the presentation over to the city manager for some opening comments. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ruthie, and good evening, mayor and council. Uh, excuse me, there is no mayor. Council members, my apologies. Um, as we discussed at our April budget workshop, um, uh, we are back here tonight uh, with our uh, next discussion for the budget for next year. Um, as we discussed at the April workshop, um, we have developed the plan here, uh, which also includes the work plan for the next fiscal year 22-23. Uh, and as we noted previously, uh, this budget uh, really includes a focus on public safety the recovery from Woolsey Fire, uh, and the continued focus on achieving the school district separation. Uh, in addition, there are a number of items uh, within the budget that uh, reflect the overarching mission of the city uh, to maintain its rural residential character uh, by establishing programs and policies that avoid suburbanization and commercialization of Malibu's natural and cultural resources. Uh, the proposed budget uh, addresses these main aspects uh, through a critical realignment of the city, uh, which of course we got into in quite some detail at the budget workshop. Uh, and we're really focusing on three areas here uh, to address the city organization, and that's staffing, uh, trying to um, upgrade our technology, and also to continue the protection of our natural and cultural resources. Uh, we will be emphasizing this evening each department's um, focus uh, on their outcomes for the next year, uh, including uh, the work plan priorities. And of course, we have detailed the proposed reorganization uh, in the Environmental Services Department and also the Planning Department. Uh, we will be hearing momentarily from our planning, excuse me, from our department directors. Uh, who will be giving details on their specific budgets. Uh, but for now, I will hand the presentation back to our Assistant City Manager, Ruthie. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And I, I'm not sure what's going on with the technology this evening, but I'm struggling a little bit too. So thank you for your patience with me. Uh, and thank you, um, City Manager McClary. This slide here, the next slide, pardon me, um, illustrates the budget development calendar. We've discussed this as well. Um, it includes our discussion so far, and we have um, actually scheduled for adoption on June the 13th. However, we do have some time, another council meeting should that uh, need to move, but um, this is the calendar that we've had out and um, certainly wanted to just make sure that the public and um, the council uh, uh, are, uh, that I thank you actually for your time and, and um, your investment in studying our plans in moving forward for next year. Next slide, please. So um, moving on to some numbers, uh, these are the same two pie charts that um, I've shared previously 
Uh, however, we do have an update on the expenditure side. And so um, the staff report that was included in your materials, as well as uh, embedded into the different departments, the respective departments, I should say, uh, do show a slight increase in our total expenditures up to 89.8 million for the proposed budget in order to reflect some of the priorities and um, the recommendations that we have heard uh, thus far in our, in our um, preliminary budget conversations. As, as we can see, the total revenues and expenditures um, are primarily, dri primarily driven on the revenue side uh, by our general fund, and so we'll get into some detail on that. And then on the expenditure side, again, almost half by our general fund, and then the special revenue funds, which are um, primarily made of our capital projects. And so we will be discussing those areas as well. I just want to touch here um, by saying that our revenues and expenditures were developed um, while maintaining the city's prudent financial principles and conservative budgeting practices. And while we will be investing significantly, as you'll see, and, and we've already discussed regarding staffing technology and the protection of our resources, um, we will also uh, be ending the current year and the budget year uh, in a balanced situation operationally. And um, we uh, look forward to getting to some of those details from now. Next slide, please. Our, our general fund revenues are reflected here. They remain strong and are driven by property sales and trans, transient occupancy taxes. Together, those represent about 62% of our total general fund revenues. Um, as I had uh, just previously mentioned, our sales tax for the, uh, the last quarter of, that was reported to us, uh, which was uh, the second quarter of the fiscal year, are stronger than what we anticipated. Um, however, we did not yet uh, revise our uh, projections. Uh, we will do so over the course of the next week or two uh, in order to reflect that adequately. It's not um, a tremendous amount. It's a few hundred thousand dollars, but still not uh, a million dollars or more. It's, it's uh, enough to uh, make a difference in our projection and should be reflected, but um, not uh, so much that it's um, a big surprise or out of balance with our conservative uh, practices and principles that, that we've um, undertaken here at the city. Additionally, there are two matters that have the potential to significantly impact the city's ability to remain operationally balanced. And um, in, this is for future years, basically uh, one for the budget year and one for the year 23-24. One is revenue related and the other is expenditure related. And so we will cover both of those in our upcoming slides. Um, just to, uh, to uh, spoiler, spoiler alert, these are the, the same topics that we've discussed in the past. Uh, one has to do with the short term uh, hosted rental ordinance. And then the second has to do with the opening of the substation associated um, or excuse me, situated on the campus of the Santa Monica Community College. In any event, to mitigate these factors, the council established a designated reserve for operating expenditures or for contingencies in the future. And that amount was 6.5 million and that remains intact uh, for the budget year. So we're not planning on utilizing any of those resources. Let me move on to an analysis of the trends associated with our major general fund revenues. And again, just know that based on the time that this uh, report was published, we'll see um, some slight revisions as we head into our final presentation of our um, proposed adopted budget uh, in June. Next slide, please. This slide illustrates corresponding consistent growth over uh, the same uh, over 10 over a 10 year time period uh, for the past three years. And we've discussed this as well. The average growth is approximately 4.9 percent um, as a conservative budgeting practices practice. Property tax revenues is projected to grow by 3.2 percent for the budget or about four hundred thousand dollars. And um, and again, I do understand that that is a conservative practice and that is what is proposed, however, at this time. Next slide, please. Sales tax, again, here is projected to remain flat. However, we probably, um, I would recommend that we will bump that up just so slightly uh, as we head into our final uh, proposed budget in June. Um, currently, we budget 4.5 million. The majority um, of 
the sales tax revenue is derived from restaurants, gas stations, uh, et cetera. And while the revenue source has returned and, and actually outperformed pre-pandemic levels, again, a cautious outlook is recommended given the current economic indicators, um, including the sharp rise in inflation, the um, planned projected increases uh, in interest rates nationally, and um, as well, we continue as a, as a nation, as a state, and certainly in the Southern California region to um, be challenged by our supply chain issues. Slide nine, please. Next slide. This slide represents our transit occupancy tax from hotel rentals over the past 10 years. It was budgeted at $2.8 million, and that actually is just right on track. We may um, outperform it slightly, but not uh, incredibly, and uh, actually may not even change this projection. Um, it does reflect an increase, our budget does reflect an increase that uh, we uh, already noted in our uh, mid-year report. And it also reflects these re, uh, revenue projections reflect uh, the increase in rate from 12% to 15%. And that was approved by the Malibu voters back in November of 2020. Next slide, please. TOT from short-term residential rentals is budgeted to remain flat for next year. That budget is about 5 million. Um, again, actual receipts are on track to outperform the budget of five million just slightly for the current year. However, we we recommend to remain extremely conservative because of the council approved potential, uh, the council approved changes, pardon me, with the anticipated hosted ordinance. And I know that we'll um, talk about that. Um, uh, the council is uh, preparing to have that discussion as well. Um, that the implementation of those changes will uh, result in a sharp decline of these resources and preliminary lost estimates are somewhere between $2 million and $3 million a year. Um, these lost estimates could also deepen should we experience an economic downturn. This is likely one of the first areas that will um, deteriorate. And so we just, again, need to be very cautious about um, revising this upward in a way that uh, puts us at any risk. Slide 11, please. Next slide. Thank you. This slide um, is just a visual illustration of the personal personnel information for the city. For fiscal year 22-23, our budget year, we're providing for 97 full-time employees and 13.27 full-time equivalents working as part-time. There are six additional positions that are requested, and so those will be embedded in the respective department reviews. And again, as was reflected in, um, uh, and discussed at our last meeting, um, our CPI for the fiscal, for the, excuse me, for the budget year is programmed at 7.4%. Um, as you may have heard, that number is even higher um, as the months have ticked by. However, we as a practice utilize an annual um, uh, CPI increase based on the numbers that are uh, published in mid-March, so through the end of February. And that number was 7.4, and that is what is built into our budget and um, what we're recommending at this time. I also gave a little history of our CalPERS rates, uh, which uh, have remained uh, pretty consistent over these past few years. Next slide, please. For fiscal year 22-23, there are some significant changes to departments, and so we'll start covering those now. Uh, the changes for management and administration are um, mainly driven by the factors that are included here. Uh, we do have an increase in our budget uh, as um, necessary to support on, on the ongoing requirements for both technology and human resources, and we're uh, requesting uh, one FTE in each of those departments. We are also reflecting operational increases for some pretty significant items, such as the increased cost of insurance premiums, both general liability and as well as, as our retiree health insurance costs. And those are significant and, and reflected in these numbers as well. We did include an increase for lighting equipment replacement in the council chambers and also some other general improvements for city hall. And um, that mainly has to do with uh, safety for our entrance doors and the, um, the automatic openers that sometimes get a little jammed and, and certainly need to be updated. And then also uh, maintenance uh, that is a larger project, the painting of the roof awnings. Um, 
uh, outside. And so that'll uh, be a nice um, and needed. It's it's required. We, we wouldn't want to let that go for too long from a deferred maintenance perspective. So those items were added um, since the last time that we that we met. We also have resources, as we've previously discussed, for a cost allocation and fee study, which has not been completed um, in a number of years, almost five years, and also a comprehensive uh, classification and compensation study. Um, and uh, those resources are also budgeted, and uh, we discussed those last time as well. Just before I move on, I want to uh, point out regarding IT, um, in order for the city to really fulfill our mission and our focus, we do need to begin addressing technology infrastructure in a more deliberate way, not just um, accessibility and transparency, transparency, but also reliability and, um, and cybersecurity. And so we, we are working to complete an assessment that was started um, way back in 2019, 2020, and was issued only in draft form, and we want to finalize that. And that will provide a roadmap for us in uh, rebuilding um, our technology infrastructure and other investments. Um, however, we don't have that roadmap quite laid out for us yet, so what we are um, recommending is to set aside $1.2 million into our technology fund in preparation for the implementation requirements of what is uh, hopefully a soon to be finalized IT assessment. And um, that basically covers it for management administration. So at this time I'll hand it over to uh, Jesse Bobbitt. To talk, no, excuse me. I'm so sorry before I hand it over to Jesse. Let me talk about public safety. I did separate public safety into its own slide. Um, just very quickly, this is an overview of our investments in the uh, Sheriff's Department contract and also the beach team and does include a slight increase, uh, but public safety is a significant part of our city's annual operating budget as it should be. And um, as we previously discussed, we do have options regarding opening the Sheriff's substation. It could be anywhere uh, it, between 2 million, 4 million, 6 million, we could spend a lot more than that if we wanted to. Um, I think uh, when, a, when one of our uh, council members here uh, mentioned a Cadillac, it's uh, sometimes I think more of a Rolls Royce if we <laughs> went 24 seven with all of the, um, with all of the menu of items. But uh, I did want to just point out that the Sheriff's Department in LA County have been great to work with. We've been getting um, some additional information regarding those scenarios. And of course, we'll be back to council to discuss um, those options, the different cost uh, structures and, and how exactly we will participate in the opening of the 5,700 square foot building, uh, excuse me, substation included in the uh, community college building. Um, just quickly again for the public, in case you didn't hear last time, uh, the building is expected to be uh, completed substantially uh, next fall. However, with other improvements and technology requirements, the um, county estimates um, opening or projects that the opening for the substation would be July 1st, 2023. So the, these additional costs would be for the following year's budget, not for 22-23, but for 23-24. Okay, thank you so much. And I will now turn it over to Jesse Bobbitt. Thank you, Ruthie. Thank you, Ruthie. Good evening, council members. I'm happy to present our community services department proposed budget for fiscal year 2022-23. Uh, this budget includes a total increase of just over $400,000, which is primarily related, primarily related to the continued reopening of programs, uh, some of our special events, um, many, of, many of which have been on pause or operating on some form of modified schedule since March 2020. Uh, these programs include our, our senior center programs, our outdoor recreation programs at Charmley Wilderness Park, our city special events such as Chumash Day and our Halloween Carnival, and then additional surf camps and spring break camps as well. Um, the good news with these programs reopening and, and the expenditures increasing for the budget related to these programs is that we also expect to see uh, a significant increase in revenue related to these programs as well. Um, one item of note with this budget is that it does not include a, a requested or proposed $55,000 from the Arts Commission. And they requested this funding for items such as a publicist to work directly with the commission uh, to increase awareness of the commission itself and its programs, an arts and business program, and then additional research related to an arts center. 
Uh, unfortunately, with the large number of, of art related programs already added by the commission over the past several years, and then a number of items already on our city council approved work plan, we're at the point where we would need additional full time staff to manage those items. That's we're, we're kind of at a break point there with with a number of, of programs that have been added just in, in arts over the past several years. So um, we're pretty maxed out at this point. Um, and the, the other part of that is that we expect the additional staff support that we would need to to essentially come to an approximate cost of about $150,000 annually. So um, it's pretty significant, and that's why it was not in included or in the proposed budget itself. Uh, finally, we have several improvements at Malibu Bluffs Park that are included in this proposed budget, and those include uh, some small upgrades to the community room at the Michael Landon Center, which will allow us to accommodate additional workout and dance classes there at the center itself. Uh, a redesign of the infill irrigation system of the majors field to more effectively cover that infill. And what that will do is it will help us eliminate the need for annual turf replacements, which costs several thousand dollars, several thousands of dollars between the city and, and Malibu Little League. And then finally, it will include the installation of large decorative boulders that would serve as bollards for the park, which we've had on our plate for a really long time. Uh, safety when we have a large number of people at park, when we have a large number of people in the park, either for an event or a program is one of our biggest concerns. And so uh, we want to make sure that we're preventing unauthorized vehicle access into the park itself uh, at all times, but specifically, especially when those programs or special events are taking place. So um, that's all I have as far as the formal part of my budget, and I'll be happy to answer any questions at the, the end of the presentation, if the council wishes. And I will now pass it on to, I believe it's Rob. Thank you, Jesse. Yes. Thanks, Jesse. Let's go with the next slide. So, uh, uh, Council, here is the fiscal year 22-23 capital uh, uh, public works um, budget. O overall, we have an increase of around $700,000 for our budget. Uh, what that includes this year, I'm, I'm excited, it is some additional help. We have one assistant civil engineer that we're going to be adding this year. Um, um, some of the things that we are reducing in our budget is actually reducing $300,000, 300000 of street maintenance that we spent last year on, on the storm cleanup. Um, during, during last year, Right before, right during Christmas, we had a large storm event that brought down uh, a lot of mud and debris, and that's where the majority of that 300000 came to. Um, but overall, the $700,000 um, extra for our budget is going towards um, new capital projects. Um, and in here, we have several capital projects that I want to go over. Um, this upcoming fiscal year, we, we anticipate having 16 projects in construction. That's around $33 million. Um, so currently right now we have four projects that are in design that, we that will carry over until next year. Uh, they may go into construction or may not, depending on um, how long uh, those design projects will take. That's roughly $1 million. And we have eight new capital projects that we're gonna introduce into this next year. That total is, is $740,000. Also, uh, in, in our work plan for next year, I've included um, some staff resources to look for outside funding for a, a variety of projects. And, and I believe I, I made that presentation a while back ago. Um, some of those projects include undergrounding on PCH, actually funding for the solar project for, for the city hall, see if we can get that back again, and, uh, and some other, um, safety and, and uh, street improvements on PCH, very large projects. Uh, um, we're looking for um, several grant opportunities that are out there. There, there are quite a number of them. And, and uh, we look forward to kind of working and, and seeing if uh, what we can get for, the, for those. Um, also that I want to point out too, is that for, we're constantly working on our Civic Center Water Treatment Facility Phase 2, in that we are seeking outside funding sources from the state and federal government to see if we could actually lower those costs uh, to the public and making sure we have that. Um, there is um, a, a good possibility. We, we have some opportunities there and, and we look forward to kind of pursuing those, seeing what we can do. In our budget this upcoming year too, I also wanted to uh, point out that 
uh, we have some professional service budget to actually have some assistance during grant writing. And, and um, uh, this year, I, I will use that assistance as much as I can to help us get to those um, get those grants and see what we can do. Uh, with that, I'll be for questions after presentation, and I think I'm handing it over to Yolanda now. Thank you, Rob. Good evening, City Council. The portion that I will present to you is the Environmental Sustainability Department for the proposed budget 22-23. Next slide, please. Under this proposed uh, plan, I'm proposing the restructure of the department with as little fiscal impact as necessary to accomplish the work plan while maintaining a strong and cohesive team. Next slide, please. Our environmental goals are the completion of the work plan and the council priority. The continuation of working on the council priorities, such as the Woolsey fire recovery, the environmental efforts, and the community engagements, while providing high levels of customer service. Next slide, please. And just to bring to your attention of some of the operations that day in, day out are, are the ones that I oversee, uh, such as plan check, permitting, and construction inspections, just keeping an eye on uh, construction inspections, the number continue to rise. Uh, we are close to the 12,000 inspections for this fiscal year, with a total of two years of close to the 22,000. Next slide, please. So to better meet the environmental sustainability work plan and to facilitate a more fluid and efficient and efficient work plan, this is this is our current organizational charge, but where I'm proposing is a restructure. Next slide, please. So in order to fulfill our mission and our work plan, I'm proposing to convert the deputy building official to a civil to a senior civil engineer position retitle the senior building inspector to a supervisory inspect to a supervisory inspection and to create a principal permit technician through an internal recruitment and also create a management uh, position for internal uh, environmental uh, environmental sustainability support this reorganization will su successfully reallocate employees and focusing on our work plan next slide please just to give you an idea of our normal operations, we have our general administration. We also have our wastewater management and our environmental programs, in addition to all the building and safety responsibilities. Next slide, please. The workflow, uh, work, the workflow uh, will improve our project turnaround time and a more fluid workflow, a more cohesive team and more clear communication. We, um, we also are looking in the uh, hopes of retaining more staff and, and have a commitment towards the, the community to continue providing the services that the community needs. Next slide. The proposed budget increases by $800,000 for fiscal year 22-23 in comparison to 21-22. This is due to the $500,000 increase for in professional services for dark skies, a plan check review and inspections, and also the additional 300,000 and increase for the staffing for full costs that council previously approved on the mid-year budget. Um, next slide, please. In conclusion, this will pro give, give me the ability to focus more in the council priorities, our work plan, and all in development of programs that are our community uh, needs and also to continue serving council. And that concludes my presentation. I'm available for your questions and I'll pass the presentation to our planning director, Richard Mollica. Thank you, Yolanda. May I have the next slide, please? Good evening, council. To go over and recap some of the points we've made previously, we too in the planning department are looking at some changes uh, that include how we operate and staffing and assignments of that staff uh, based on looking at past practices of the department, changes that have occurred over the last 15 years, 
and then also the goals and the work plan as set by the city council for the department. If I may have my next slide, please. This is just an overview of some of the goals that we have for the department in the upcoming year and as part of this budget. Um, as we mentioned previously, goals for us include managing the needs of the council's work plan and targets for the department, as well as also the needs of the community and how we interact and address uh, their expectations. Next slide, please. The tasks that we're going to take on and we're proposing to utilize to address this, as we've mentioned, are some restructuring of the department, which I'll get into in a bit more detail. Look at ways to better manage the caseload and expectations for each planner. Implement technology and then also look at ways to develop metrics for future decisions and tracking of progress in the department. If I may have my next slide, please. The purpose of this slide is to show uh, basically the, the breakdown of how the department functions and the positions we have in the department. Essentially, the department right now, as I mentioned previously, is divided into three working groups. We have the, the division that handles all the planning. You've got the planners. We have an administrative division. That's the folks that uh, provide the support for the planning department as well as address public records requests and track projects through the department, uh, serve the clerical needs. And then we have our code enforcement division, which is uh, responding to not only violations uh, of the building code or our zoning ordinances, but they're also tasked with the implementation of the short-term rental program as well. Next slide, please. This is just some quick metrics on the department. The planners, as you can see, we're looking at close to 2000 planning projects. This below in the pie chart is a breakdown of the various stages of review and construction and where those are. The planning department's involved with the project from when it's first submitted to the city and it's conceptual and on paper. And we follow that project and interact with it um, as far as the last inspection of when it's done. So in the field, uh, when you have something tangible and construction taking place, uh, we're, we are responsible to have knowledge of that project from at any point in its uh, phase. And some of these phases can last upwards of 10 years uh, from when the project's first submitted to the city to when construction is completed. And that is not necessarily a reflection of the city's practices. It's sometimes uh, construction is accomplished in phases and they build out the project and, and they focus on the house, then the guest house, or, and then the pool. They, they may break up their project. If I may have the next slide, please. What you have here are some uh, metrics that we've put together just um, uh, to show how the department uh, has accomplished the various tasks uh, throughout the last two years, just and also give us a projection of what we expect in each of these categories. And uh, when I say that, we're looking at the amount of decisions that are issued by the department, the number of conformance reviews we complete, the number of documents that we provide as uh, public records requests, uh, just to give you an idea of, uh, to put some numbers to what it is that the department uh, produces throughout the year. If I may have my next slide, please. What you see here is where we propose to go. The department uh, proposes to break up, the biggest change would be the planning di uh, division of the department and break up the planners into, as I've mentioned, three subgroups. A group that focuses on advanced planning, another group with the current complex projects and another to do current planning, but the smaller short-term uh, projects, uh, quicker turnaround type projects, uh, things that are small like fences or gates um, and swimming pools, things that are usually not too complex or involve presentations to the planning department, uh, planning commission, excuse me. This, what you see here is just 
the first year of a multi-year build out, as mentioned in the staff report, the agenda report that accompanies this item. Uh, there are plans to increase staffing as we move forward with this. Uh, it, yes, the impacts are not going to be great at first because we're not bringing on everybody all at once. However, there is a learning curve here. There's a that the folks that we bring into the city need to uh, they need to learn and uh, gain knowledge to be efficient. And so that is why we propose bringing on these new positions uh, each year and phase to uh, take more of a phased approach to it. And ideally what you'll have with this is one uh, lower caseload per planner, which will hopefully work with one goal, which is staff retention, uh, but to achieve the larger goals, which are maintaining the work plan goals that are set by the city council. Right now, uh, as you noticed in the previous organization chart that shows the current staffing. Planners are expected to do both the advanced planning and the current planning. Uh, the advanced planning is oftentimes the work plan items. These are updates to codes, uh, new ordinances, or, or new policies that the council is looking towards. Those are always competing with the, the current day-to-day -day planning projects. And oftentimes it's the current day-to-day -day planning projects that, that get the attention of the planner because we have uh, you know, members of the public following up on those. Uh, those are things that people can see and feel immediately. So they they tend to be a little bit more focused on those. Um, our goal here with breaking up the department into different subdivisions, uh, like you see here with these subgroups, uh, you'll have folks that focus on the council's priorities uh, and are able to dedicate their time to that. And we can make certain that we're achieving our yearly goals as well as those of the public. If I may have the next slide, please. So this goes into just a little bit more detail about basically the three subdivisions we would have uh, under the planning division of the department. As you can see, it's as I mentioned, we want to have uh, one of the goals of attaining is customer service. So that's why we have uh, a current planning group that's going to be dealing with the the quick turnaround stuff, the the items that come to the to the planning counter, items that we receive phone calls or emails about, event permits, uh, business applications uh, for clearances to utilize space in the city. Uh, those are all small, uh, you know, we would have folks that specialize in that. And then also folks that can then, uh, who have a little bit more seniority, a little bit more of a background in planning, work on the more complex projects. So this gives us a, an opportunity for employee retention there by creating a growth, a, a growth pattern for people in the department, for employees. And then lastly, as I mentioned, that last specialty of advanced planning. Next slide, please. One of the new positions that we mentioned uh, in the agenda report is the new development services manager. This would be uh, an administrative specialization, but would function as the go-between between between the public and the department to help uh, members of the public manager, but we're also looking to add an additional planner and also uh, the ability to try to get back our uh, intern position 
of that, uh, we would have two part-time positions that would equal one full-time position. And the goal there with the interns is uh, once again, to have a, kind of a feeder program to get folks into the city, start training them and build future staff, as well as having staff for uh, additional research and uh, to address some of the inquiries we receive. If I may have my next slide, please. What you see here is just uh, once again, kind of a refresher of where we are with the adopted budget and the proposed budget changes in the amounts. And then also uh, in the lower table there, you can see the three additional positions added. And as I mentioned, this is the, the first phase of a multi-phased approach over the next couple of years to build the department to attain the, the full potential of what we're trying to do here. And with that, I'll hand the presentation back to our interim city manager, assistant city manager. Sorry, Ruthie. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you, Richard. I just wanted to point out before we moved on that the year one of the three-year plan is the plus three FTE that are proposed for 22-23. And in the following two fiscal years, there. Um, Richard and his staff have done such an amazing job of providing a detailed roadmap to increasing their staffing um, in years two and three for a total of 10 additional positions. And so I wanted to, I just wanted to be clear that that's what we meant about the first year of a three year plan are these three FTE. And then in years, uh, the following two years, subsequent two years, there would be additional um, uh, development of these three main areas that Richard discussed. Okay, next slide, please. The administration and finance subcommittee, um, oh, I'm sorry, we're, uh, one more slide, pardon me. There you go, thank you. The administration and finance subcommittee reviewed and discussed the 30 general fund grant applications received this year. On May 2nd, the subcommittee heard from all applicants and continued their discussion um, to May 18th. And next slide, please. The uh, subcommittee recommended $200,000 in general fund grants for 22-23. And as was published late last week after the second meeting on May 18th, the subcommittee recommended grants to 26 organizations as is reflected here. And of course was included in the supplemental information that was uh, published again late last week. Okay, next slide. This is um, a, a illustration of our historic general fund reserves or a general fund reserves over the 10 year, uh, over a 10 year history. Uh, notwithstanding the negative economic impacts of the pandemic over the past two years, the city's uh, prudent financial principles, and again, our conservative budgeting practices are reflected in the city's uh, strong and stable reserve levels. General fund reserves are estimated to decrease just slightly in fiscal year 22-23, but it's driven by an increase in capital project activity. And our total general fund and designated reserves are projected to be over 42 million. Um, and we also know that this, um, this amount exceeds the goal of 50%, so it's about 97%. Um, the goal of 50% was established um, by the City Council, and um, also there is another um, a benchmark, if you will, which is 65% in order to retain the highest credit rating for the city, and again, that is per the city's underwriter. So we are uh, still well within those benchmarks. Next slide, please. The total general fund balances um, are illustrated in detail here. They include the um, undesignated, the designated, and um, as well some other reserves um, that have to do with our uh, Woolsey fire activity, our FEMA and Cal OES liability, um, and all of those items are, are uh, summarized here. The reserve levels, again, they remain strong, and um, we do anticipate a total general fund reserve level um, at this time of 55.4 million projected for the end of the budget year. In addition, I uh, added the note in the materials that we published a couple of weeks ago, and then as well here on this slide, that the city recently received 
a restricted settlement in the amount of $4.2 million. This settlement is for pass-through payments to FEMA um, as, uh, as was part of the Woolsey Fire settlement. And so we will be restricting that entire $4.2 million until all of those projects are um, completed. Next slide, please. In summary, our budget proposes continued investments in support of the city's mission. Again, the emphasis on staffing technology and protection of the city's natural resources. Our proposed budget maintains strong reserves that support the work plan and its intended outcomes, and also maintain our fiscal stability and sustainability for the future. Uh, of course, uh, very important aspects as well. So the next steps this evening, I, I do believe, include um, uh, opening the, the public hearing and, of course, your discussions and del deliberations on both the budget and the work plan um, this evening, uh, culminating with uh, your consideration of a final um, proposed adopted budget uh, in the coming months. Month, pardon me. <laughs> and before I hand it back to you, um, Council Member Fair, I do just again want to express my appreciation to the whole finance team, the leadership of Renee Nierman, um, to Joe even for uh, jumping in and um, uh, uh, being a, a very helpful a second set of eyes on the information and um, the not just the materials before you this evening, but also um, the maintenance of the integrity of the city's financial operations. Uh, truly, I, I do thank and, and acknowledge the finance team. And then, of course, thanking the city manager, my department had colleagues as well. They've been very patient and flexible, as has the city council. And I certainly appreciate all of you for your leadership. And we are all here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruthie. Uh, to you, everybody on the financial team, certainly to City Manager McClary and all of the department heads, seems like there's job security, no shortage of work to be done. So thank you to everybody. All right, moving on, uh, do we have any public speakers? Yes, you have three uh, people signed up for this item. They are Pamela Conley-Ulick, Ryan, and Joe Drummond. I don't see Pamela in the meeting at the moment, so we'll start with Ryan. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, hello. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, actually, could you take me after the next speaker? Um, I left my notes in the other room. Okay, let's move on, please. Thank you. Then we can hear from Joe Drummond next. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I encourage you all to take your time and wait a month before approving this budget and make any changes necessary and make sure a full council is present. I personally would love more time to review the 193 pages. For example, I thought planning was going to immediately implement the plan to solve the backlog occurring with fire rebuilds and other items not only three new planners being one associate planner, one assistant planner, and two half-time interns. That won't solve the current issues. We need someone, preferably a seasoned former veteran planning staff member with institutional knowledge, as stated previously by Richard from the city of Malibu, to determine what is a true fire rebuild and what is incremental or serial development of new construction and goes against the mission statement as mentioned by Steve McClary. We can possibly start with one year contract for this manager or hire this permanent development services manager if they are the one who could prevent the ongoing white collar abuses and false exemptions. We need this to stop. We need this planning manager to manage and allocate and track the builds to the planners, et cetera, and possibly go over the codes with the staff at regular meetings in combination with any changes necessary with the races. Um, so where is the budget for this watchdog needed for the planning department to protect regular residents trying to put through small projects and in-kind fire rebuilds and scrutinize large developers? How will this be addressed in this budget? The development services manager hopefully can work and communicate with the applicants hired consultants like architects and engineers and proactively contact them about requirements to stop the backlog. The planning department needs some relief by a seasoned coordinator right now more than ever, perhaps someone like Joyce Parker-Bozlinski or who has already got a contract with the city 
It's a grand waste of time for the planning director or a planner to step in and find out why the workflow of someone's permit application is backed up and taking too long. We need someone to track these and get them moving. The planning department needs a manager, either part-time or full-time consulting for at least a year. The planning department is self-sufficient by the applicant's fees and can afford this, especially with our huge reserve. Is the development services manager budget taking place of a senior taking the place of a senior administrative analyst and is this immediately implemented the city also needs to avail itself of every opportunity to pay down all pension liabilities so it doesn't come back to haunt us when things are tight and why do we the city offer after the county takes over 200 million dollars of our property tax money and leaves us with only 15 million should we be paying for county services such as four to nine million dollars for the sheriff and for the new substation and even the 900k we pay on beach teams to patrol the county beaches this makes no sense and needs to be negotiated accordingly thank you and now we can circle back to ryan uh thank you i'm i sure wish there were more than two people to speak on the this huge budget um I wanted to again pitch that you need to fill the vacancy of a grants writer professional for this city. Grants writer will bring in multiple times their cost in in project funding, um, and I said you could uh, dovetail that in with um, oh, that other aspect I mentioned earlier. Um, so the the second is that we're, we're having the state um, come at us every year for low-income housing, um, affordable housing, and those numbers are just gonna be getting worse every year and piling up. One of the goals of that program is retention of affordable housing. And the only affordable housing that is possible is the housing that already exists because of the cost of land. And the city is proposing in a hostile takeover maneuver to uh, take over the assessment district of the sewage treatment facility, which still has 15 years remaining useful life and has full land value use in Malibu. The land in Malibu is worth five million an acre. And so those costs should not be um, exacerbated by duplicates when it's not necessary. And for phase two of the proposed residential hookup of the 191 condos, the city needs to look at providing grants for those costs. There's hookup charges, and then there's the increased operational cost of the city's uh, large plant that do not exist in the unmanned plant that is working just fine and will continue to work first fine for 15 years if we just let it keep running. So the next is I'm not so sure you need so many uh, department head for public safety. Um, a lot of people might fault me for having said that, but the, the director of emergency services is the city manager. and We're a small city, and that is an intrinsic and expected duty of the city manager. I don't know that we need to add more people in between the people performing the work and those in charge because communication is important during emergencies and disasters, and we don't need more links in the chain. And there are enough people, I think, that can coordinate that department. The beach team needs to be rethought so that it's not an at overtime charged service. The team, the beach team does great work and they're needed. It's just configured economically to the disadvantage of the city. It could be privatized. They do it on Third Street uh, in Santa Monica. Um, the other is the substation, and I'd ask the council for another minute because it's very important if it's possible. There's only two speakers. I don't think we can set that precedent, precedent this evening. Thank you. And Councilmember Ferrer, I'm checking, and Pamela Kalmiulik has not rejoined the meeting, so that concludes public comment. Okay. Thank you, Kelsey. All right. Uh, Councilmember comments. Steve, Mikey? I'll give it a go. Um, wow, thank you for the presentation. And to somebody who worried about approving it tonight, we're, we're planning, if you listened, we were planning on approving it the first meeting in June, leaving us a backup 
meeting if something happens. So um, don't worry about that part right now. We're just trying to make progress. Um, I'll bite on one thing. Uh, how how do we go after grants? Is it by department? Um, Ryan keeps mentioning a grants writer, but I don't. How, how do we actually get this millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars? I know Rob goes out and finds a bunch of it, but citywide, how does that work? I'll take a stab at answering that question, Council Member. And and you are correct. Yeah, we we do it on a department by department basis. Um, and we do look at those pretty aggressively. And uh, if you'd like, Mr. Thibault could uh, could probably detail some of those efforts. I know he's working pretty hard right now trying to get grant funds for a lot of number of uh, projects, but primarily for the water treatment plan. So yes, that is how we handle it. Okay, Rob, um, do you feel understaffed in the grant writing area? Or how does that work? Uh, well, I, I mean, luckily I, I have some really good consultants that are really on top of the variety of grants for public works and, and um I, I had them already put together a huge matrix on all the available grants that are out there including at the state level and federal level right now we're waiting to hear back from federal government on the infrastructure bill on on some of their grant requirements but that's a big funding source that could be coming out soon too but um yeah, that's um, having assistance from a consultant that kind of helped put that together and put together the grants that knows all that information is very helpful. And, and uh, like I mentioned during my presentation, uh, we do have funding within our proposed budget to have that work done. So we're, we're kind of really looking forward to maximizing that and see the best we can do. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, yeah. Kind of on that same note, too, it is. Um, it's not just my department that's looking for but for grants too. It's uh, I work closely with all kinds of all, all of our department heads on sharing information. I get grant information from our consultants from emails and and, and we share them a lot and, and we use that information to go after those available grants. So so we all work together. Uh, we all work. Um, separately to kind of get stuff done, but we all work together to make sure we're we're spreading the information out. Thank you, Yolanda. Do you have a comment on? Yeah, just um, stating the same that Rob was mentioning uh, under the Clean Water, uh, Public Works, and the Environmental Programs work very diligent together. I think one thing that has helped us a lot is all your um, relationships and partnerships that we have, not only with other agencies but other with the consultants that we get to know about this uh, opportunities for uh, the grants. And like this morning on the, the presentation, we talked about the SB 1383 uh, through call recycle. We learn about that possibilities to get that grant and we were awarded a portion of it. There's gonna be a second round on it. So it's, it's a, a little bit of combination of, of the staff that is working on the on the different uh, programs, but it's also uh, us as director and, and the leadership that are keeping an eye on in every possibility and make sure that we are we are uh, submitting the applications on time. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Um, I guess this is just kind of a general comment on staffing, which we've already talked about. Just to sort of repeat it. You know, if if there is sta unexpected staffing needs, I think this entire council has showed that, you know, they want to support each department and the city manager. If if things change, you know, and who knows what changes. Um, but if you need extra bodies, come, please come back to us. Um, but, you know, very overall, I think this is a very exciting budget and plan because it is forward looking. Um, it's making some substantial changes. Um, we spent quite a bit of time talking about it at other meetings as well. Um, so I really appreciate it. I think this team does amazing work. Um, Mr. McClary, as I remember, I don't know if it's part of this budget, so I'm almost, yeah, I will mention it. <laughs> as I mentioned, as I remember, there was potentially small bonuses for staff. Is that part of this or is that something totally separate? 
yes, that is uh, included in this budget. Um, and um, our interim assistant city manager could, could give some details on that. But before she does that, if you could just indulge me, I wanted to make two quick comments regarding uh, grants. Uh, one that we also work closely with California Strategies, um, our, uh, our lobbyist strategist firm. Uh, they also assist us in the, um, in, you know, seeking uh, grants. Uh, and then I also wanted to just make a comment about um, the challenge. Um, and while it's not a bad idea, but the, the challenge of, of bringing on some, something along the lines of a full-time grant writer uh, the problem is is there's really two main issues. One uh, is that the grants don't all come in, you know, um, you know, consistently throughout the year. Uh, there are times when um, you know you might have multiple grants going at once, and other times when uh, you know there would not be enough to necessarily keep um, a grant writer busy. And the other issue that comes up um, is that oftentimes there is specific expertise that is needed. Uh, for that grant writing. Uh, and so by going out and seeking consultants or firms, a lot of times we can find the, the persons who really know how to write those proposals uh, and, uh, you know, get in the right information that will, uh, you know, get your grant more likely to be funded. Uh, so I just wanted to share those two comments. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to Ruthie, uh, who I believe can, can give some details. But yes, we do have uh, something in there in terms of longevity bonus for the employees. Thank you, um, City Manager, and thank you, Councilmember Pearson. I, I apologize that um, I meant to uh, add that into the PowerPoint presentation. It is included in the staff report um, that uh, was published with the materials. Um, there, as was mentioned, uh, actually in concept, at our last conversation, um, we have put some uh, pen to paper and um, come up with a proposal for the council's consideration for a one-time compensation payment for all non-contracted full-time employees. And we have one uh, part-time, permanent part-time um, employee. The payments are recommended in tiers according to longevity with um, the total cost estimated at approximately $155,000. The three tiers are as follows. For employees that um, in the tier that is the most recent hire, hired between January 1st, 2022 through June 30th, um, uh, 2022. So within those six months, the one-time compensation payment is proposed at $750. The next tier, the employees hired um, between January 1st, 2019 and December 31st, 2021, that middle tier, the proposed one-time compensation payment is 1,500. And then for um, the longer term employees, those hired on or before December 31st, 2018. So um, those folks who have um, been with the city through all of the uh, trauma starting um, starting at the time with the Woolsey fire, um, the one-time compensation payment is proposed at $3,000. And um, the, the, those numbers are the uh, sum total again is estimated $155,000 and is included in the proposed budget and the numbers you have before you. I think, uh, thank you for that. Um, and I had read it. I was just kind of recycling here to make sure I had it right as much as anything. It's a, a rather large document. Um, I think the one thing that stands out to me is what incredible department heads we have here. And without our department heads, we'd just be, it'd be not a good situation. So, you know, in public here, um, city manager, Steve McClary, I really think our department heads deserve some sort of uh, acknowledgement for the the war they have been through and um, that they have really held together the troops, I think. But of course, they're my main point of contact. I've talked to them a lot. I'm constantly amazed at every single one of them and they've made themselves available and I'm super thankful during a really difficult time. So that just seems kind of stands out to me. Um, other than that, I'm kind of the only thing I'm probably sad on, I mean, it's just you can't win on a budget, right? But I'm a little sad on the art commission funds. I just so want to 
they've just the art arts in Malibu have been through a tough time um tough to get a TUP tough to pull off art events and COVID and with fires it's just been a tough time for the arts commission so and the arts community so I'm hopefully hopefully more good things can happen there going forward and with that I'm just uh appreciative and amazed with everybody and uh, I thank you very much thank you Mikey okay Steve I saw your hand up I'm muting myself here uh I sort of second everything Mikey just went through, and I want to reinforce the statement that says, look, uh, if you guys need some help, let us know, all right? I mean, I think that's a real, we don't want to burn people out. We want to make sure everybody's got, a, you know, has got the resources to get the job done. I mean, you look at some of these tasks that we have ahead of us, there's there's a lot of work that's going to have to take place. Uh, so if if this, the council can help, let us know. We'll do what the heck we can to make that happen. Uh, with that, I, I, I agree with everything else Mikey said about the. It's good to know that we got this grant writing program under control. That I think you know, Ryan's been bringing that up in every meeting, and I think we've at least got an answer for that right now. That says we've got that process in place. And I guess finally, I just want to thank everybody: Ruthie, Steve, Renee, everybody who put together. This is one hell of an effort. And you got to realize you're doing it with Excel spreadsheets, which is <laughs> which is quite a task. All right. Uh, so, you know, I, I compliment you all for the job that you've done. Thank you very much. And I think you got us headed in the right direction. So with that, Karen, back to you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I will uh, reiterate or, or reconfirm everything that's just been said. And I want to thank uh, Everybody at the city, uh, we've taken a conservative approach to the budget year after year. And one of the rewards for that is coming up with uh, a much more optimistic picture uh, than could have been, especially after the fire and uh, with COVID still going on. Um, you know, at the budget workshop in April, we discussed a lot of things. Uh, I don't think we need to go over everything again. Um, I am very happy that the city is in a position to offer the longevity bonus. Uh, I think it's just just a, a thank you to everybody who's worked so hard and in the most difficult circumstances. Um, the department restructurings are, I think, the right answer to the needs that we've seen. Uh, I just don't know how you all do what you do, uh, but I thank you for it and uh, particularly Yolanda and Richard, uh, I think the department restructurings that you outlined tonight um, are gonna be a huge improvement. So thank you for that. Uh, I agree also the council should remain flexible. Um, and I think you know we are. Uh, and I just appreciate this whole uh, look at balancing the long range planning with the shorter term needs. So uh, I just thank everybody. And as we've already stated and is in the staff report, uh, this will come for adoption on June 13th. And I believe uh, if need be, we could go one more meeting uh, to adopt the budget. Okay, so uh, with that being said, uh, do we have a motion? What is the motion for tonight? Do we need a well, motion? Um, Provide direction. We've done that, actually. I take that back. No, I don't believe we need a motion except for perhaps to receive and file tonight's report. Let's receive and file it. Okay, so let's consider that a motion and a second. Um, we maybe have a roll call, please, Kelsey. And, and I'm sorry, Councilman Fair, who was the second? Did I hear? Uh, myself. Uh, oh, I made the motion and Steve thank seconded. Councilman Fair. Yes. Councilmember Yurin? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Uh, I just am noting it's 8.32. Time for a break. Should we take yeah. a five minute? Can we just make it five minutes? Come back at that 8.37. Would, that would be great. That would be awesome. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, we'll wait another minute. It's 8.38. Okay, it's 839, let's resume. We are now on to item 4B, collection of fees for the implementation of the California Integrated Waste Management Act within the Malibu Garbage Disposal District. Um, may we have a staff report, please? Yes, good evening, uh, city council member. Um, this evening, we're conducting a public hearing for the collection of the fee for the implementation of the California Inequality Waste Management. And this is an item that comes to you every year. Um, what it is, the resolution authorizes the city to collect the county tax roll for residential commercial, 60 cents per single family household per month and 50 cents per cubic yard disposed for commercial sites per month, making it a total of $7.20 and 20, $7 20, uh, cents for single family dwellings. Uh, the garbage disposal district is at east, Eastern City limits to John Taylor Drive to Malibu Road. The County of Los Angeles managed the uh, contract for the solid waste collection for the district and that was established in 1940. Uh, so this evening we're recommending to conduct a public hearing and also the adoption of the resolution uh, to give an authorization to the county for this tax roll. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. Okay, do we have any public speakers? No, you don't have any speakers for this item. Okay, council comments or a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. And that is resolution 2218. Right. Isn't okay. that what I said? Yeah. Steve, just, second. One, one, yeah, I'll second, but I got one quick question. There's nothing controversial about this. I mean, this, this is pretty, yeah. Okay, I'll second, done. Thank you. Okay, um, John, do you need to read the uh, the item or? No, this is a resolution. It's not an ordinance. I don't need Excuse to read Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Kelsey, roll call, please. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Okay, we are moving on to item 5A, potential tax measures and other potential measures. All right, uh, may we have a staff report, please? All right, um, good evening. Um, the item before you now for consideration of um, potential tax measures and other potential measures previously identified by the city council. It's come before you several times um, for consideration. Council had initially directed staff to bring back options to address um, projected revenue shortfalls as part of the budget adoption in June, 2021. At that time, the projected um, fiscal year 21-22 general fund revenues were estimated to be less than general fund expenditures, and $3.8 million from the general fund designated reserve was utilized in order to balance the city's operating budget. Next slide, please. Fortunately, since that time, the city's revenues recovered more than anticipated. The mid-year budget amendment approved in January 2022 included $5.66 million increase in general fund revenue and the drawdown from the designated reserve initially reflected in the adopted budget for fiscal year 21-22 was no longer required. However, significant impacts to the city's revenue and expenditures are anticipated in the coming years. Next slide, please. 
As Ruthie noted during the budget hearing, the city is anticipated to face revenue impacts and potential increases in expenditures in the near term. Most notably, there will likely be revenue and expenditure impacts associated with the proposed implementation of additional short-term rental regulations and opening and staffing of the Malibu Sheriff substation. In addition, there are also economic factors that could indicate a potential economic downturn. Next slide, please. To help mitigate this, staff presented council with a recommendation from the Administration and Finance Subcommittee regarding potential revenue generating measures on November 8, 2021. Based on the direction received at that meeting, on April 25th, staff presented information on potential transaction and use tax, uh, parking occupancy, and documentary transfer tax, at which time council directed staff to return with the following information transit occupancy tax measure, a 0.5% transaction and use tax measure, and the process to become a charter city so that the city can implement a documentary transfer tax in the future. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the city is authorized to levy a transit occupancy tax upon the privilege of occupancy in a hotel, motel, or other, other lodging. TOT is collected by operators and remitted directly to the city. In July 2020, the City Council adopted Resolution 2037 to submit the question of whether to increase the City's TOT from 12% to 15% on the ballot for voter consideration. In November 2020, the Malibu voters adopted Measure T, increasing the TOT from, uh, to the 15%, which is effective, um, went into effect January 2021. This rate applies to the city's six hotels and motels, one RV park, and the um, short-term rentals um, in, of residential property. Um, as was mentioned in the budget hearing, there's currently 213 active uh, short-term rental permits. Next slide, please. In fiscal year 2021, the city received $2.6 million in TOT from hotels and motels, and $5.4 million in private rentals. This was due to an increase from the very low levels during the pandemic, as well as the 3% increase in the city's TOT rate. In fiscal year 21-22, the city is projected to receive approximately 2.8 million for hotels and motels and 5 million from private rentals. In the proposed budget for 22-23, the city is projected to receive approximately 17% of its general fund revenue from TOT. Next slide, please. Um, I'm sorry, this, this goes to the other slide, but I don't think we need to change it now. Future TOT revenues from private rentals may be significantly impacted by the anticipated short-term rental ordinance and preliminary loss estimates are estimated to be two to $3 million. This slide before you shows um, TOT rates throughout California. So there, there's no cap on the uh, TOT rate under state law authorizing the imposition of TOT. So it's up to the council and ultimately the voters to decide. However, if the rate increase is extraordinarily large, um, a court could find it unconstitutional. For reference and comparison, we have this chart here. It was compiled by the city's um, sales tax consultant, HDL Companies, um, based on data from November of 2020. Yeah. And um, as you can see, the highest TOT in California was identified um, at, well, it's not shown here, but there's a, uh, the highest that was identified was 15.5%. It was approved by the voters of Palo Alto in, um, in 2018. So including Malibu, there's four cities in the state with a TOT rate of 15%. The other cities include Anaheim, Half Moon Bay, and Ojai. Next slide, please. This graph shows the breakdown of TOT rates throughout the 88 cities in LA County. Malibu is currently the only city of a rate of 15%. There are seven cities with a rate of 14%. And I've heard at least one of those cities is looking into raising its TOT. But right now, Malibu is sitting at the highest rate, um, at least again, of November 2020. Next slide, please. If the council were to consider a measure to increase the city's TOT rate by another 3%, so, may, so going from 15 to 18%, it is estimated that it would generate approximately $1.55 million uh, uh, annually with approximately 550,000 coming from hotels and motels and approximately 1 million coming from private rentals. 
um, based on fiscal year 21, 22 projections and assuming the current short-term rental regulations are in place. Changes to the SDR ordinance would diminish these increases. Um, and while a TOT increase could help mitigate the anticipated TOT revenue loss, it is not likely to offset the loss um, anticipated by the hosted ordinance, which again is estimated to be between two and $3 million annually. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the next slide should look familiar to you, so I'll try to go through them fairly quickly. The city's current sales tax is 9.5%, uh, of which the city receives 1%, known as the Bradley Burns tax. With voter approval, the city may adopt a district tax, also known as a transaction and use tax. Currently, the allowable sales tax in LA County is capped by the state at 10.25%. Uh, this leaves up to 0.75% that the city could charge for transaction and use um, or TOT. Council directed staff to specifically bring back information on a 0.5% increase, which is estimated to generate $2.8 million annually. Revenue from TOT differs from sales tax in that TOT revenues are allocated to the place of first use, as opposed to where the sale is negotiated or the order is taken. This would be paid on normal sales tax generating businesses like retail stores, service stations, and restaurants, which visitors and residents alike pay, as well as any purchases shipped or delivered to a Malibu address from outside the city, including vehicles, um, boats, motorcycles, which would likely be paid only by residents. A more detailed analysis um, was provided by HDL and included in the staff report. Uh, next slide, please. On April 25th, staff presented this analysis that you see here on the slide before you, prepared by HDO on how potential um, TUT measure would impact residents versus non-residents. As you can see in this chart, it is estimated that 73% of the proposed TUT would be generated by non-residents and 27% would be generated by residents as compared to the estimated 80-20 ratio of the existing Bradley Burns sales tax. This percentage is generated by non-visitors. Um, the, sorry, the percentage to be generated by non-visitors is um, higher than in most cities and one of the highest that HDL has seen since they've been um, performing this analysis. Next slide, please. If council is interested in pursuing a TUT uh, ballot measure, it will need to decide what rate to propose to voters at an increment of 0.125%. Uh, up to 0.75%. HDL has provided revenue estimates for the three rate scenarios shown here. Estimates range from 1.4 to $4.3 million, depending on the rate applied. It is important to note, um, and I, it was noted at the last meeting, that the maximum sales tax rate increase available to Malibu could decline in, in future years below the 0.75% currently available. Within the last six years, um, the county um, has approved two countywide sales tax measures, Measure M for countywide transportation and Measure H for countywide homeless services. If other measures were approved on a countywide basis, they could reduce the potential sales tax um, increase Malibu voters could approve because the maximum tax rate uh, is currently set by the state uh, for LA County at 10.25%. Um, next slide, please. On April 25th, staff reported that after further research, unfortunately, um, and consultation with the city attorney, it was determined that the city of Malibu, as a general law city, cannot raise the documentary transfer tax rate above the existing rate imposed by the county. And this revenue generating measure is only available to charter cities. In response, council directed staff to bring back information on the process to become a charter city. The process is detailed in the staff report and outlined briefly here. In general, in order to become a charter city, the city needs to adopt a charter. <laughs> the charter can be developed either by the city council or by a charter commission elected by the voters. In either case, the charter must be adopted by the city council and filed with the city clerk, after which um, it must be approved by a majority of the voters. Next slide, please. There are a lot of advantages and disadvantages of becoming a charter city, some of which are highlighted here on this chart. Given the requirements involved and the deadlines for the upcoming uh, general election, council may want to consider this for future election cycles. 
Next slide, please. A TUT increase or a TUT tax measure would require voter approval to be enacted. The requirements for voter approval depend on the purpose of the tax funds. A vote on a general tax would be used for general city purposes um, and requires a simple majority, it must be held as part of a consolidated general election. And the next one is scheduled for November 8th, 2022. Um, a special tax in which the funds are used for a dedicated, like specific purpose, requires a two thirds supermajority to pass and does not need to be considered as part of a consolidated general election. If the council is interested in placing a tax measure on the November 2022 ballot for voter consideration, conventional wisdom suggests that the council select one tax me measure to focus on. Limiting the focus to one tax measure is said to improve the chances of that measure gaining voter approval. It is also recommended that council consider focusing on either um, in um, increasing the TOT or imposing a TOT at a rate to be determined by the council. Next slide, please. If council wishes to initiate a ballot measure for the November 8th, 2022 general municipal election, it must direct staff to bring back resolutions to submit the questions of voters, setting priorities for arguments and, um, and rebuttals and direct the city to attorney to prepare an impartial analysis. The council must call for the election ballot measures at a council meeting prior to August 12th. Council is scheduled to meet on August 8th but is recommended to agendize the resolutions at an earlier meeting if possible. In order to pass, the resolutions must be approved by a supermajority of the entire council. Um, and that concludes my report and uh, for this item and staff is available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. All right, uh, do we have any public comments? Yes, you have three speakers for this item. They are Ryan, Joe Drummond, and Norm Haney. We'll hear from Ryan first. Thank you. I wanted to say that um, yeah, I agree with the option of exploring the charter concept. Um, I know that there were going to be some downsides, and I think it needs further presentation. But I would suggest um, you take a, a step back and look at what um, the cost could go for. Um, is that we always are going to be saddled with um, burdens of tourists and uh, sheriff response and evacuation planning and all these things that go with having 16 million visitors a year. And so uh, we need to look back, though, at the revenue sources and maybe restore those, uh, as well as looking for new ones. Um, I do not suggest or recommend that you increase a sales tax on Malibu residents because that would apply to things that we purchase here. And you have to be uh, cognizant that um, tax awareness and economic planning is an industry. There's you know, tax attorneys and, and accountants that do this for a living. And discretionary purchases do not have to be tagged to Malibu. You could go to Ventura and buy your diamond ring instead of having it shipped here, or you could ship it to your vacation house, you could have your appliances picked up by a handyman and delivered in Malibu if you don't want to pay the extra percentage point or three quarters of a percentage point. It's, it's possible to do. Um, the audit that you probably need to do is see if we're getting all of the sales tax that is currently due the city uh, for various deliveries and so forth, like Sears, for instance. <clears throat> um, the city of Malibu had a sheriff station and the land, the building, and all of that was funded through what we pay for the per person salaries and so forth in contract service for the city. And yet the county closed the sheriff station. And then they had the audacity to charge the city to occupy the empty closed sheriff station and pay rent as a city hall for several years. And then the city decided to go rent something better. The, the problem is that that's covered in the overhead and administration of the county sheriffs. And here we are paying for it out of a bond measure of 20 something million for the um, joint use at the uh, Santa Monica College. We're paying for it all over again. And then they want us to pay more for them to go be inside that building. We need to find out why the county has reneged on 29 years of funding a building out here 
and why they want to now um, you know, charge us all this money to operate the building here. Maybe they should just send some of the administrators from over the hill and have them here instead and it'd be neutral. I'd like you to look into that. But the land value is worth four million and the improvements is over two million for Ryan, what we're paying for. That's your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joe Drummond, followed by Norm Haney. Thanks for letting me speak. The budget proposal stated that majority of city's annual sales tax revenue is derived from restaurants, gas stations, and grocery stores. So how can 80% of this be non-resident when it's the residents here who are all use these services too? We residents should not be penalized and we have a huge cash reserve projected at over $55 million and already seen as a greedy elitist town when we actually have a lot of regular, not uber wealthy people long time living here. Why do we need to increase any of our taxes higher than everyone else? And gas prices are already so high, we don't need them to go any higher. I also imagine raising sales tax will make it harder for local businesses to thrive by making things more expensive. I do believe the HDL companies that conducted their estimates calculated the restaurant statistics completely inaccurately. Lunch in restaurants around town during the majority of the year during the week are residents and also residents at least two to three times per week for dinner must be a majority of residents such as Soho House, which requires Malibu residency or some ties to Malibu and Nobu, for example. It must be way more than 27% of residents that are affected by paying sales tax. With regards to the TOT specifically, it should wait to see what happens with the hosted ordinance at the Coastal Commission if the income from this will actually go down. There is a parking tax in San Francisco that is 25%. If we were going to raise any taxes, it should be the parking tax, nothing more. This is not a heavy hit on residents or even tourists, especially as we have to pay so much for our beach teams. This could be used to fund law enforcement services. This should be the item to be put on the ballot. And again, why do we, the city, after the county takes 200 million of our property tax money and leaves us with only $15 million, should we be paying for county services, such as $4 million for the sheriff, for the new substation, or even the 900K we spend on beach teams to patrol the county beaches? This needs to be negotiated well with the county, possibly through our attorney on the council or city attorney. And given our huge reserves, I hope that some additions to the Arts and Parks and Recreation Commissions can be heard and granted, such as hopefully a garden or public park next year at Heathercliff and PCH, where the tow yard will be an eyesore and possibly a traffic backup all summer. Thanks. Our next speaker is Norm Haney. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we Hello? can hear you. We okay, can hear you, Norm. Good. Thank you. Um, honorable uh, city council members, uh, there's a point where an additional bundle uh, will break the camel's back. And, you know, I, I, I've read the staff report. Basically, only four cities in the entire state of California has a, a transient occupancy tax uh, of 15%. There's only one city in the entire state that has an occupancy tax of one half of percent more, 15.5%. So when I hear somebody say, well, we could raise it to 18% and have the reputation of having the highest uh, TOT in the entire state of California and perhaps the country. Wouldn't that be great? Well, it might be if people would continue coming and spending the night in Malibu. But I think you're gonna, if, if, you, if you move in that direction, your revenue is gonna go down. Now I've been working on a 39 room hotel for the past six years. And I'm having trouble finding an operator um, that, that wants to take it on. He said, there's not enough rooms and the cost of doing business at Malibu is high. So I anticipated that the revenue from my hotel would be 1.3 million for the city. Um, and now if I can find somebody, it'd probably be closer to 1.5. But if the occupancy tax goes up, um, I might not be able to find an operator at all. And then the revenue would go down. So I, I don't I don't think Malibu 
wants the reputation of having the highest TOT for hotels and motels in the entire country. Um, those are my comments. Um, I, if, if, if you look at the potential revenue, it's not very much uh, by raising the TOT. Um, and I, I happen to agree with uh, Joe Drummond on on this issue. Um, I think we need to wait and see what happens in the future. Uh, and um, hope that we get over this slowdown caused by uh, COVID. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate um, all the work that you do for the citizens of Malibu. Thank you. And Councilmember Fair, that concludes public comment on this item. Okay, thank you, Kelsey. Okay, uh, council members, any comments? Sure, I'll wade into the deep end on this one. Um, first thing I noticed is that it appears our city manager, Steve McClary, specializes in working for cities that have 15% TOT. I'm not sure what that's about. So you're probably the only city manager in the entire state of California to accomplish that. So congratulations on that. Um, I, I, I don't think raising our TOT is actually the right call at this point. Um, it, it raises money, but I don't know, 18%. I hear chance of it'd be so far out of the line of any other city. I don't want to get sued over it. I don't know what that that's about, but so I need to learn more. Um, the parking, someone mentioned a parking tax. We don't own any parking lots. I mean, that's, it's so limited. That's not, <laughs> I think we saw what that would raise and it's, it's, it's tiny. Um, we don't own the beach parking lots or anything like that, or that would be the idea of all time. Absolutely. So, um, I think the TUT is probably the most interesting one. I'm unsure of it, to be honest. It's 50 cents per hundred dollars, five bucks per thousand, fifty dollars per ten thousand. Um, you know, might be interesting to see what the citizens think on that one. I, I don't know. And and onto the onto the charter one, I feel like I, despite the charts on how it works, the pros and cons, I still don't feel like I know enough. Um, and I don't know why. I just don't know. You know, advantage of not being as under the thumb of Sacramento does appeal to me greatly. Um, I wonder why it doesn't seem like I, I don't know how many small cities are charter cities. And and uh, I'd like to understand that a little better. It does seem very interesting to me to look at, too, but it looks like a long range project. It's not an overnight project. Um, so I'll. I'll uh, I'll uh, let everyone else go now and maybe they'll help me form some opinions. Thank you. Thanks, Mikey. Steve? Yeah, Mikey, I agree with you on the uh, TOT. I think the the risk of raising it so high that somebody goes to court and tries to cut it down could cause more problems than we need. I'm surprised we don't have more residents coming in talking about the sales tax. You know, that I'm just, I mean, I don't know whether they know what we're doing or they're, I would sure like to get some more feedback from them uh, before we move forward on this thing. I mean, it seems to me that the sales tax is the route to go if we're going to go that way. But boy, I should like to hear from them uh, before we make that final decision. So I don't know, maybe before the next city council meeting, if we can find some way to get, you know, some, some information out to the residents. And, and, you know, and Elizabeth, you know, that chart that the sales tax consultant put together, I mean, have them take a real good look at that. Make sure that they're, I mean, Joe Jumman's comments were not that far off in terms of saying, is it really giving us a good perspective of who's going to pay and where it's going to come from? So just, if you know, they could give it one more look before we decide what they're going to do. I, I would like that. Um, I think the Charter City, Mikey, you're, you're right. This is not a short-term program. <laughs> uh, 
writing a charter, I, I have I have no idea what. Well, back to your comment. I don't know what you know. How, are small cities charter cities, or the, is it primarily larger cities who adopt that? Uh, you know, what, how long will it take us to write a charter? Uh, I have no idea. I, I would certainly like to have the flexibility to, you know, control their own destiny a little bit more. Uh, and what I don't understand is, you know, with this charter city, apparently you can change the charter. I mean, you know, and and it seems to me you need a real stable city. <laughs> so people aren't changing the charter every second day. Otherwise, we're going to drive ourselves nuts. So I, I go back to your thing. I, you know, I just don't know enough. I like to talk to some people who have done this, get some perspective of what cities have. have. I'd like to know what kind of cities do it. And I'd love to be able to talk to a city that, that made the move to, to do this, right? What did it take? What did they have to do? I mean, how difficult was it for them? Uh, just so we, I, you're right. I just got to get, I've never done this. So this is way outside of my comfort zone. So something that makes me a little bit smarter and gives us a little more comfort in what we're doing. Uh, so my suggestion would be, look, uh, get a better look at this sales tax thing and make sure the chart we've got is actually giving us good information in terms of who's going to be paying. And somehow I'd like to get some more information from the residents. I'd like to just hear from them a little bit. Look, I, I do think, you know, the, the revenue is something if we're going to get it, this may be the best time to go after it and do that. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, this this constant drumming that says, whether it's the beach team or the uh, sheriff station, and should we be having a different kind of relationship with the super, you know, the, the, I don't know how to pursue that, but boy, I think it may be worth trying to do something there, right? I mean, in, I, and I was going to ask you when we did the budget, you know, we got $900,000 for the beach team. I thought the beach team was being reduced this summer. I thought it was. I mean, I, I remember I read something on that line. So if the beach team is being reduced, why aren't our funds being reduced? I don't, so, uh, I don't know if you know, this, that helped anything, Mikey. I, I think I pass on the TOT. I like to do something on the sales tax, but I want to get more information on that and get some more information from the residents, please. It's it, Karen. Thank you, Steve. Um, okay, uh, let's do the easy one first. I too agree. We just raised TOT. I don't think this is the time to make that a ballot measure again. Um, I will ask uh, either John Cotty or Steve McClary or, or anybody in the room here. Do you have any uh, numbers on the threshold number of residents in a charter city? I, uh, Council Member Fair, I do not. Um, I have seen it with some smaller cities, and there are obviously large cities like Los Angeles. Um, Culver City is, is a charter city, and there are some other cities that are exploring it. I can bring that list back to you. Okay, I know Santa Monica is. is Santa Monica is a charter city as well. That's, but. I think, 90,000 people, maybe more than that. Okay, um, I think that would be worth uh, looking into. Um, Uh, it seems to me the only thing that might make sense is the TUT. Uh, I think we've got potential revenue decreases uh, with the hosted short-term rental. We have uh, increases that we know of, certainly with the sheriff's substation. Um, the beach team, we know we have every summer. Uh, I think I think we might want more information on this. Uh, and bring it back. I'm not sure if it can be, be brought back at the next meeting or a month from now or two meetings from now. Uh, Steve McClary, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I'll need to get with the team. We do have a little bit of time between um, between now and the next regular meeting. So I'm not sure if we could put all that together. Um, I think we would probably want to focus on maybe bringing back the information um, on the TUT. Uh, it sounds like the charter city discussion um, uh, at least has, has piqued the interest of the council. And it sounds like the council would like some information back on that. 
Um, so we could work on bringing that back, um, but probably not at the June 13th meeting. Um, so I don't know if that if that helps. And oh, and I just have to respond to Councilmember Pierce and I. I can take ne neither blame nor credit for the T O T increase in Ohio that that actually took uh, place after my tenure. <laughs> so I'll I'll look to Ruthie. Do you uh, have a sense? Um, sorry to put you on the spot here, but do you think we would be able to come back on the 13th for some of this? Or I, and the I, only reason I do. Okay. I yeah, I um let me just a couple of things quickly, um, city manager. Um the I I we really did I, we agree that um polling is probably necessary. Um and so we need to adjust the contract for the consultant that does uh the polling because it will exceed um the annual limit and and we we can it's possible to bring that adjustment back uh, by June 13th. Um, we'd have to go through ANF first, so heads up to our subcommittee members, and then uh, get them uh, hitting the ground running uh, the very next day. It's possible that they would be able to provide us a, a quick enough turnaround time to bring information back um, prior to when council would need to take any potentially need to take any action. So, um, Liz, I don't know if you had anything else to say on that, but it, it would be tight, but there, it's po it's possible, I guess is, is what I'd say on that. Okay, I see we have two hands raised. Um, I just wanna acknowledge, I realize we're up against a deadline if we're to get the this on the November ballot. Um, so, just telling you, I recognize that. Um, and, and I, you know, Steve, I heard you ask if, if they could take a harder look uh, at uh, the non-resident versus resident portion uh, of a potential TUT increase. I mean, to me, the numbers, I, I can't imagine they would come up with a different number. And what we're seeing right now would be 73% non-resident and 27% uh, born by residents. So uh, I'll stop there. Uh, Mikey and Steve, I'm not sure who had their hand up first. If you know, I just, go all, ahead. All I want to do is confirm what Steve McClary said, that you know, put the TOT on, on the shelf someplace, put the Charter City back on the shelf for a while, and let's co concentrate on the sales tax and you know focus on that and see where all that takes us. The other ones we can take a look at later on. That's okay. Thanks. I agree with that. Mikey, go ahead. I think what's hard here and not to speak for Steve, but I will, and he can tell me I'm wrong, is that in A and F, we really like the documentary transfer tax. <laughs> that really solved a lot of issues in an easy way. Um, and so I, I'm still having a little heartache over that. Um, that I thought we just like found this sweet spot and hit this little home financial home run that made sense because our rates low got yeah, looked golden so the reality of that though looks like even if we go the charter route because it makes sense beyond that we're two and a half years from that so um yeah that's where i'm in a, in a little bit of mourning and i think we're going to find the stats are absolutely right if you do the the math on 15 million visitors in town us us residents can show up all we want all day long but we are besieged by people that don't live here. And, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, every restaurant knows it that I know of because when the numbers start dropping in the off season, it impacts them greatly. Right. So um, anyhow, that, that's it. Just a couple of comments. Thanks. Just one last one, Karen, if I may. You know, this, the dealing with the county for the beach team and I mean, is, does anybody, I've never had to deal with the county in terms of trying to get them to change what they're doing or how they're doing it or argue with them. I mean, does anybody believe there is even a path there to go back and talk to them and say, look, guys, we think we're getting shafted in some of this stuff um, and we need you to help us out? I mean, I, I, I don't know. I've not, I've not gone down that path. I mean, I'm willing to try it, but I'm just wondering if anybody's got a better, more experience than I have in terms of, I'm, you know, I'm just 
spinning my wheels or is there really something there we think we could get done? I, I'll i try to answer that question and I'm not sure that I fully understood it. I'll try to I'll try to break it apart. Obviously, if we're talking about the beach team, that is something that is voluntarily, you know, uh, that is an option that the city is taking. Um, we could we could we could eliminate that. We could reduce that down. Um, we could have further discussions with the sheriff's department about, you know, how we could better tailor that or take a more surgical approach. Um, so at least on the on the beach team, I, I think that's probably my be my best answer on that. Um, I'm I'm not sure if I understood your other question, just in regards to, I mean, the sheriff's budget. Um, I mean, we we that was the sheriff get... station. I'm just wondering if there's a way to get the county to pitch in more for the sheriff station. So it took our four million dollars and reduced it somehow. I'm just so we we are actually in still in discussions with the county on what contribution they will give towards okay. that. Uh, and I think one thing that I I want to point out here that was not at least immediately clear to me when we began these discussions. I'm sure it was clear to the to the, the former officials who had worked on this, but me coming in a little bit midstream was that, you know, we're actually not having to pay anything for the, you know, we're not leasing the station or paying for that or the construction of the station. The only thing that we are really on the hook for going forward is whatever level of service that we, and when I say we, I should say the city council or, or the city desires to receive from the sheriff's department. And that could include maintaining our status quo service level that we're receiving right now uh, or, or altering that some way. Um, so I don't think we're necessarily on the hook per se uh, to you know, increase those costs above what we're getting right now. I think the question that we're going to get into and what we're getting into is it comes down to, I think, you know, what is, what is best for the community? What does the council want? what is perhaps the best bang for the buck those those types of questions but we're not up but we're not we're not painted into a corner in terms right. of having to to take any of that obviously you know the sheriff is going to need to have some minimal level of service uh to deliver to the cert to the city but i don't think that that is necessarily what we're we're talking about reducing that per se cool. i hope that helps that does one you know I, and, and i could be wrong i thought the beach team number of sheriffs were going to be reduced this summer. Did I, am I, was I reading a newspaper from another city or? I, um, I believe the reporting on that has been um, mixed. And, um, and in fact, we don't plan on any reduction in service level. Uh, and I, I wish I, I saw Susan's name, I, I would um, do that. Okay. Uh, impose Steve's pop quiz, but I don't, I don't see my conversations with Lieutenant Waters and with um, Susan Duenas has been that there are opportunities for the county to help support the level of service that we currently contract for on for the beach team. And we should continue to pursue okay. those opportunities for them to um, uh, pitch in, if you will, in okay. covering those costs. Yeah, I thought I thought I read something and I just apparently I didn't. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm done. Okay. I, I think I think Ruthie kind of nailed it, Steve. I think first it'd be worthwhile for you uh, maybe to talk with Captain C2 and Lieutenant Waters about what the beach team actually does because it's far more than just people on the beach. So it's like summer enforcement. Um, but to get more details would probably be educational. I'm, and I'm, yeah, I think Ruthie kind of said it that looking for grants for our station, considering we can make a compelling case of, you know, 15 million visitors in a town of 8,500 with a, you know, a huge highway going through us, you know, seems to be a, a compelling case in my mind, at least for grant funds to help with public safety. But yeah, I, I will do that. I'll get a hold of, of Captain and, and Waters and see what they think. You maybe get Susan Duane is involved because she knows more about this than I do. Okay. That's okay. Thank you all. Um, and I will just add, um, it seems like I remember uh, past reports from the sheriff uh, saying that the, the, the most frequent incidents they cite for on the beach are drinking, uh, which obviously um, puts everybody at risk of drowning and then uh, traffic accidents. 
uh, dogs on the beach. And then, you know, they are there. They're right here for uh, needs that take place off the beach. But the whole thing is bringing to my mind the question about other cities that have sheriff's contracts um, and county jurisdictional beaches. I know the city of Santa Monica has jurisdiction over their beaches and they have their own police department. Uh, I think Manhattan Beach has its own police department, but those are county beaches. So I don't know what other cities fall into the category that we're in. And I think it's worth looking at. Santa Monica owns a lot of the beaches, actually. Right. That's what I mean. And they have their own police department. So, you know, if we can find an apples to apples comparison, it seems like it would make sense. I'd like to think we're not getting a worse deal than other cities, but I think it's worth verifying. So back to um, this item, it looks like the consensus is to take transient occupancy tax off the table um, to take, uh, what was that called? Documentary transfer tax, at least defer that discussion to later because that involves Charter City. Yeah. Um, and it looks like the thing, uh, the only avenue we might be going down at the moment is TUT. Um, and that looks like um, the one half percent option. So again, bearing in mind the time limitations we have, if this were to be on a November ballot, sorry, my dog only barks when I unmute. Um, Elizabeth, Ruthie, can, can somebody tell me how much time we would have to consider this and still make the November ballot? Well, the challenge will be if you do want to do um, some polling or outreach to the community. What we've been told it is that, I mean, it could take a, a month to a month and a half to do that work. We do need to bring back, we had done an RFP for, for uh, survey services um, in in the fall winter time frame we have someone under contract we could amend their contract but that will need to, as ruthie mentioned to go through anf and then back to council so we can do that for june 13th and i can ask them for how, how quick they can do this and maybe it's not the same sort of robust polling you would do for um a ballot you know measure it could be some if it maybe if it was a somehow a modified version scaled down to get you just some information for which you can base your decision um we can see. I can. I can have those conversations starting tomorrow. You know and, the the other the uh, other the other path may be to hold a separate city council meeting. You know, put do a mailer out to the res and say, okay, sometime in the end of June, we're going to hold a. We want you to come in and tell us what the hell you think. Uh, you get it in one evening. You may not get as much as much feedback as you'd like, but it, it'll at least give us a flavor and it saves us this month of turnaround time. And trying to get something that you know, God knows if you can get that done in that time frame. That's a thought. Yeah, that's that's that is a thought. Thank you, Steve. It's um makes me wonder if that that would get us enough input, but maybe. Um, and I'm just looking at page nine of the staff report. It says that we've got to uh, get a vote on this by August 12th or prior to August 12th, and I think. I don't think August 12th is a meeting date, is it? We have a meeting on August 8th. 8th. Okay. And that's our first meeting back after the break. Yeah. So. Prior to that, it's July 11th. Right. Okay. Um, have we given you enough to go on? Do we need to put this into a motion? Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, come back with an answer, guys. That's what we want you to do. Give us the answer. <laughs> The hell we're paying all this staff all this money for this. <laughs> I so, second uh, the motion. <laughs> Either Steve or John, can you let me know? Do we need you, to get a motion? You do not need a motion, provided that uh, Ms. Quinto and Ms. Shavelson have sufficient direction. And certainly we can help with that. Okay. Were we good on that? Yeah. Okay, okay. cool. Thank we're you, good. everybody. Thank you. Okay, we're on to our final item, which is 6A, and that is the library set aside fund for fiscal year 2022-23. And uh, do we have a staff report, please? Yes, you do. Um, good evening, council members. Um, there's a, a PowerPoint slide. Um, maybe they can pull it up. If not, it's not, it's not okay. Um, 
The item before you now is the use of the Miami Library set aside funds for fiscal year 22-23. This item becomes before the council every year after it's been reviewed and recommended by the library subcommittee. I'm going to provide a brief background on the evolution of this item just to provide some context before focusing on the subcommittee's recommendations for the upcoming year. In 2008, an MOU between the county library and the city of Malibu was established to govern the use of property tax dollars apportioned to the county from property taxes within the city of Malibu for the purposes of providing library services in Malibu, primarily at the um, Malibu branch library. As part of this MOU, every year, the county sets aside the difference between the Malibu Library portion of property tax revenue, which is approximately 2.45%, and the Malibu Library expenses into a designated fund. As of June 30th, 2021, the fund balance held by the county totaled approximately $14.1 million to be used by Mal for Malibu Library facilities and services. Assuming all the previously apportioned annual expenses and revenues continue as projected, the fund balance is projected to be approximately $16.6 .6 million, according to the county. In the last two years, the set-aside fund balance has grown more than anticipated, due in part to the fact that the allocations have gone unspent um, during these past two um, years during the pandemic and have remained in the county set-aside fund for Malibu Library. In order to optimize the allocation of the set-aside funds and maximize the benefit to the community, <clears throat> the city has conducted two library needs assessments to gather community input and prioritize library facility and service enhancements based on the community input received. The first was completed in 2005, and it focused primarily in the um, large-scale renovation of the existing library. Those renovations were completed in April 2012, and since that time, um, the funds have been used for expanded operations, such as um, the library speaker series, the enhanced uh, service hours, additional staff, security guards, and other library-related supplies and services. The second needs assessment, which was led by a working group of community members, members of the Friends of the Library, and representatives from Malibu schools, preschools, and businesses, um, it included focus groups, one-on-one -on -one interviews, an online survey, and a town hall meeting. Um, the 2018 needs assessment was accepted by the City Council on October 22nd, 2018. And at that time, Council directed staff to work with the County Library to use the set-aside funds to implement the immediate and short-term recommendations of the 2018 needs assessment where feasible, develop conceptual plans to relocate the main entrance of the library, analyze the feasibility of expanding library services on the west side of Malibu, and lastly, to analyze the resources needed to develop a Malibu historical archive. Shortly after the 2018 needs assessment was adopted, the Woolsey fire broke out, spread through Malibu, and in the aftermath, um, the city shifted its priorities and the council did not include the Malibu library projects and the city's adopted work plan and it did not allocate set-aside funds towards the larger scale or more ambitious of projects listed. Before we move on to the recommendations, it's important to note that the county library staff has done work to, improve, to address some of the recommendations in the 2018 needs assessment as part of its ongoing operations. Updates on the 59 recommendations identified in the needs ass assessment were updated um, and provided as part of the staff report. The, Malibu Library Subcommittee first met on April 20th to review the use of the library set-aside funds for fiscal year 22-23. And at that meeting, the subcommittee reviewed the expenses for ongoing enhanced services and requested that representatives um, in attendance from the LA County Library Foundation, Boys and Girls Club of Malibu, and Malibu High School submit written funding requests for additional Malibu set-aside funds to be used for library eligible purposes. Proposals were submitted and include the following funding requests. $500,000 to support the establishment of an endowment for the LA County Library Foundation. $25,000 to fund instruction and supplies for a special school course and summer program to be offered by the Boys and Girls Club. And $26,390 um, plus teen librarian costs to fund um, library supplies and services at Malibu High School. County Library staff performed a preliminary review of these requests 
and found them to be eligible for Malibu Library set aside funds and supportable with one exception. The county library voiced some concerns about the Malibu High School's um, request for joint use staffing for a teen librarian due to, to some potential service impacts to the, the Malibu Library. However, um, the county library expressed an openness to collaborate and partner with the high school as they had done pre pandemic. All the written funding requests were included in the staff report for tonight. Uh, next slide, please. So on May 2nd, the subcommittee reconvened to consider the proposals and recommended that the city council approve the use of the Malibu set aside funds for fiscal year 22-23 to provide funding for the ongoing expenses for service enhancements as listed on the slide before you, totaling $918,000. Next slide, please. The subcommittee also voted to recommend that the city council fulfill the requests submitted by the Boys and Girls Club in the amount of $25,000 and the Malibu High School in the amount of $26,390 plus some teen librarian costs, understanding that the teen librarian may not work out exactly as proposed. Um, and lastly, the subcommittee also recommended that the council discuss the LA County Library Foundation's request for endowment funds. The written request, as I mentioned, is included in your staff report. And as council discusses the use of the set aside funds for fiscal year 22-23, um, the recommendations of the library subcommittee and the requests from the LA County Library Foundation, city staff and county library staff are available to answer your questions. We are joined tonight by Gladstone Buckner, the County uh, Library Regional Administrator for the North Regional Office, and Melissa Stallings, the Malibu Librarian. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, do we have any public speakers? Yes, you have seven speakers signed up for this item. The first few are Laura Rosenthal, John Erickson, Laura Bollinger, and Jefferson Wagner. We'll hear from Laura Rosenthal first. Good evening. Um, I'm pleased to be here as a board member of the LA County Library Foundation. I'm asking your support for 500000 to establish an endowment. This grant of library set aside funds is an investment in the library and the foundation and in the future of our community. To give some context to this request, the library foundation supports the library with funding and by building support for library services that are accessible and free to children, teens and adults throughout the county. The foundation has IRS standing and operates independently from, but with strong coordination with the library and library staff attend all of our board meetings. Thanks to the city of Malibu, I've watched the library foundation flourish and make an impact with its support in just three years. In 2019, we distributed $48,000. This year, we're on target to distribute 100, excuse me, $110,000 to county libraries. In 2019, we hired its first paid staff in more than a decade, thanks to uh, the library set aside funds. And these are not city of Malibu funds. We hired Andrea Carroll, who continues as the executive director. She couldn't be here today. So my board colleagues and I are here to answer questions. Establishing an endowment for the foundation is so important for the library and for Malibu. Before we hired Andrea, the foundation had just a handful of donors. We couldn't support the library in any meaningful way. Today, we have a solid base of donors, nearly 1,000. We're trusted, we raised enough money to support our operations and grants to the library. We're at a point where an endowment is essential. It's a statement that the foundation and library are here for the long term. Many organizations won't donate to a foundation that doesn't have an endowment. We are only asking for 3% of the $16.6 .6 million set aside funds. And we have already started conversations with three other cities that have these funds. Creating an endowment is a significant investment in the future of Malibu. It will create a sustainable source of funding for LA County. It will fund things like 
early literacy and environmental programs that the county can't reliably support. Our health and vitality are linked to that of our neighboring communities. People come here from throughout the county. They work here. They play here. Their children go to school here. They're essential to our lives and our community. An endowment will ensure reliable funding to them, as well as allow the library to continue providing online courses and resources available to Malibu residents. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Erickson, followed by Laura Bollinger, Jefferson Wagner, and Pamela conley Ulick. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Council Member John Erickson from a city just over east to you in West Hollywood. Um, I am the vice chair of the LA County Library Foundation, um, and it's great to be here with you all. And also the TOT conversation as a city that relies on TOT, I've been... <laughs> It's been great to feel like I had a full council meeting tonight listening to all of you. So thank you for your service to your community. Um, thank you to the opportunity to support the foundation's request for funding to establish this and, and the endowment. Like my colleagues here that will speak tonight, thank you for the city's earlier and very generous gift. Your investment truly pays off. Like everyone that will speak tonight, I joined the foundation because of its promise, an organization supporting a library system I respect and love, and an organization set to rocket ahead and make significant positive impact with the library for our communities. Creating an endowment says a lot about the organization funded and about the funders. It's a statement of belief in an organization and its values, and in this case, support for literacy, creativity, lifelong learning is now more important than ever. These vital skills and qualities are for today and most importantly for tomorrow. Like my colleagues have said, an investment in the foundation and endowment is an investment in your community and in the greater LA County community. I'm committed to building a strong community, one where we all will flourish, just like you. And like Malibu, West Hollywood actually has a library surplus as well. It's minimal in comparison, but like Malibu, we understand we win when we build up our neighbors and when we say yes to building literacy in all forms. I've started these conversations with my colleagues about adding to the endowment, building on what Malibu has started with its investment in hiring an executive director from the foundation. And now I hope investing in the library's long-term sustainability by establishing an endowment for the foundation. I look forward to helping continue the success that Malibu started and has championed. And thank you for considering the Library Foundation's request. I hope we're all staying safe and healthy. And thank you to the service that you provide the great city of Malibu. Our next speaker is Laura Bollinger, followed by Jefferson Wagner, Pamela conley ulick and Teresa Earle. Thank you. Good evening, um, council members. Um, my name is Laura Bollinger, and I'm, I'm the immediate past chair of the Library Foundation. I'm also a longtime member of my community's Friends of the Library group in Claremont. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to thank you and the city of Malibu. The, the city's gift to restart the foundation is really dear to me. When I joined the foundation in 2016, it was an all-volunteer group that met monthly. We distributed small mini-grants, and and there was very little coming in. So this group was spending more than it was bringing in and that's not sustainable. I was part of the group that worked with our, our then new library director, Sky Patrick, to search for an, an executive director. Sky and all of us on the board realized we needed a paid staff member, someone who could relaunch the foundation and with us drive it to be a strong partner with the library. At that time, we developed an extensive MOU to ensure the foundation had proper financial policies in place that we carried adequate insurance and that there was accountability for the funds. Attorneys for both sides reviewed the documents for legalities and both sides agreed. And this is very important to hear. Our bylaws limit our support to only the LA County Library System and its related friends groups. Thanks to Malibu's funding, we were able to find and hire that leader. We've worked closely with Andrea Carroll over the past three years. And as Laura Rosenthal told you, the foundation has grown exponentially and it's at a crucial point. People love their library and they want to support it. We've seen that even during the pandemic. I've seen firsthand through my work with the foundation and with the Claremont Friends of the Library and also as a trustee of Citrus College, how important the library is for people's socioeconomic success. Claremont, like Malibu, is deeply connected to its neighbors. Our community benefits when our neighbors are strong. The foundation plays a part in that. 
For example, last year we funded arts workshops and LA opera programs that families and older adults especially enjoyed. These enriched our community and also our neighboring communities. We are on the edge of LA County and some of our patrons live in areas supported by different library systems. Like Malibu, these individuals from other communities are integral to our community. And as you and I know, we're stronger if they are too. Claremont, like Malibu, has a strong community of library supporters and has one of the largest friends groups in the county. Funding from an endowment will ensure that we can provide um, vital programs that educate about the arts and environment that build literacy and lifelong learning. Since the foundation has been in a growth mode over the last three years, we have grown our database to from under 100 to 1,000 donors, but over 2,000 library supporters. As a natural part of this growth, we have expanded our capacity to be able to encourage legacy gifts, matching gifts, and stock gifts, being able to share with individual donors and grant-making organizations that we have an endowment shows the maturity of our giving programs and is a proven way to increase spending opportunities. Thank you for investment in the foundation and thank you for considering our request to fund an endowment. Our next speaker is Jefferson Wagner, followed by Pamela Kalmiulik, Teresa Earle, and Katherine Hennigan. Good evening, council members. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much for this opportunity and thank you for your participation on behalf of your community. Uh, I've had a considerable amount of time on the city council and uh, I had time on the library committee. I was there in 2008 when we set up the uh, MOUs. I voted on that. I agreed that everything should move forward the way it was going. These set aside funds that you're discussing this evening about the outcome of what you're going to do are for the community of Malibu. And I understand the last speakers with their well crafted speeches uh, are enticing you to move bureaucracy out of the city and take $500,000 that was earmarked for a Western Malibu library. That's always what it was. It was suggested many times in the past that we have an experienced library built at the Heather Cliff property in the last five years. So there is an opportunity here for you to keep those funds local. During my time on the council and in the steering committee, this, the library committee, we got rid of the bookmobile, which certainly contributed to that high amount of money that we have in the funds now. And you still have the opportunity to keep those funds local. Understand again, those are well crafted speeches given by the people that are proposing this, but you people are here for the city of Malibu and the city of Malibu residents. Please understand that. Thank you very much. Our next speaker would be Pamela Kalmiulik, but I don't see her in the meeting. We'll try to circle back. And next we'll hear from Teresa Earle, followed by Katherine Hennigan and Ryan. Good evening, esteemed city council members and staff. I wanted to speak firstly to thank the subcommittee for your thoughtful and in-depth investigations and hard work to ensure the best use of the library set aside funds. On behalf of our schools and all of our children in this community, we are truly grateful for the ongoing portion of a uh, small portion of these funds that help educate our community's children, but truly increasingly in a robust way to help with 21st century library services and all that that means in a changing world and educational systems. I wanted to say that I strongly advocate for the use of these funds as recommended by this subcommittee for our kids. It will truly help ensure uh, new and ongoing databases, technology, software, and other elements of library services that would otherwise need to be raised by parents and parent dollars and efforts that are truly stretched thin after a very difficult four years. We are so very thankful and thank you for the time this evening. Our next speaker is Katherine Hennigan, followed by Ryan. Uh, good evening, council members. Um, I'm Kate Hennigan. I'm the current board chair of the LA County Library Foundation and immediate past treasurer. Um, like my colleagues, Laura Rosenthal, Laura Bollinger, and John Erickson, 
I want to thank the city of Malibu for its generous and far-sighted gift to restart the library foundation in 2019. Um, your investment continues to pay off. Um, thank you as well for considering the significant immediate and long-term returns of establishing an endowment for the LA County Library Foundation. I personally joined the foundation board over just two years ago, and I saw an organization with great leadership, an organization that supported one of the nation's, if not the world's, leading civic institutions um, that is the LA County Library. And I wanted to be part of that, especially because I saw the foundation's potential and its clear upward trajectory. I understand and relish creating sustainable and successful organizations. I founded my own company and I value a strong library and a vital role and the vital role it plays in all of our communities. Uh, the library foundation in the past three years has tripled its assets, developed a strong and committed base of donors and built support throughout the county. We're increasing our reach and our support for the library day by day. And it's time to accelerate that. Um, <clears throat> with gifts that support the library today and into the future. Um, Malibu's gift will start an endowment that the foundation will consistently add to with gifts from individuals and institutions. People will be able to make gifts now and also with legacy gifts. Uh, the foundation will immediately launch a campaign to raise an additional $100,000, leveraging the $500,000 we're requesting uh, from Malibu, and it will establish an endowment approximately two times the size of our current budget. Um, we'll continue to increase our annual budget, and with it, our endowment. Malibu's gift will jumpstart those efforts and will um, be recognized as a leader in supporting literacy and building its own community and the communities it's part of. Um, so thank you for your support this evening and your consideration of our request. And um, thank you for um, everything. We really appreciate all of you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ryan, followed by Joe Drummond. Wow. Um... It didn't take long for some people to come swarming after the money that uh, the city through its audit. Um, we stopped the bleeding from LA County of stealing the money and now it's finally built up and their sharks are already circling. Some of them ex council members. There's a job or two to be had in this organization, a very cushy high paid job. And I would say steer clear of this one, folks. The library fund is building and we need it to acquire land and build a library in Western Malibu that has a bunch of meeting rooms and maybe a uh, arts or senior facility or something as, as a split and adjunct use for a combined parking lot where the library closes at six o'clock at night and you can have a, a an arts event, you know, they don't start till seven or eight o'clock at night and you wouldn't have a problem. This is a money grab. Um, <laughs> I, I think I see Kara. Well, we know it is. Um, the library and its funding is self-sustaining and it's growing. And we got $16 million projected. We already heard that LA County Library Foundation exists and they've, they've tripled their assets and received gifts. Donors don't give money to programs that are funded by the government. They just say, we'll get the government to give more money, you know. Um, <laughs> coming back to shake the money tree. Um, I'm sorry, Laura, you're on this, this foundation and you came over to rattle the money tree in Malibu. Well, we're going back to the looting concept again. The library and the city need to, dis to determine what their needs and uses are, not some extraneous group of, of do-gooders, nonetheless, that would add an extra layer of bureaucracy and administration and costs for this shadow group. I urge you to not give away any money, half a million or whatever, that a foundation as a charitable foundation is eligible for tax write-off donation money and they're getting it. If they have something to bring to the table to help Malibu and the library, that's great, but be very cautious here. Do not give away our tax money to some um, group that wants to start running a sideshow. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joe Drummond. 
Hi there. Yes, I agree with residents Jefferson Wagner and Ryan Embry. This is a half a million dollar funding grab of funds allocated for a Western Malibu library with meeting rooms, or it could be a senior facility. All these funds need to be saved up to buy land and build Western Malibu Library. County has all our money. They can ask them for it. If anything, just give them $12,000 a year for costs. This is our tax money and it needs to stay in Malibu. Thanks. And Councilmember Fair, I still don't see Pamela in the meetings. So that concludes public comment. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kelsey. Okay, uh, Mikey or Steve, would you like to make any comments? Yeah. Uh, I have some questions, if I can get those out. Uh, when I look, and, and I'm, I'm going to sort of break this down into three different sections. You've got the $918,000 that I guess the library committee uh, recommended. Who Who is the group that says this expenditure is tied into what the MOU allows us to do? It's tied to a library item. Who makes that decision? Who checks that? So Council Member Gearing, may I first um, introduce, there's another um, representative from the County Library. Administrative Deputy Grace Reyes is also here with us tonight. And okay. I apologize, Grace, that I had missed you before. Um, and I would say that those questions regarding what is and is, is not applicable um, uh, uses of the funds uh, for the life that are, allocated for library purposes, those are deferred to the county library. We submit those to the, the county, they review those requests, um, they let us know what is and is not eligible. So they've gone through this list and said all these things are, are consistent with the MOU we have for spending library set aside funds. Yeah, well, I also, if I may, um, just point out that the $918,000, those are all ongoing um, enhanced services that the city has been funding um for the right. last several. so i understand that i'm just when i look at them i just i just have i sit back and say what is an outreach librarian so that was actually in response to um the needs assessment and the interest of having um more offerings specifically in the west side of uh, malibu also just more interaction with the community um so it's an in order to have a librarian that can actually um, go to community events, for example, go, go to the high school, do an event there, also do, um, I believe they partner with our community services department and read um, to children in the park. To, in order to have a librarian who can do that, we have an additional position so that then we still have staffing at the Malibu Library. So this person reports to somebody in Malibu? This, yes. Okay, that's cool. They work that's out of the Malibu Library. Gotcha. That's, that's all I need to know. Uh, you got, you've got the Boys and Girls Club Library Related Supplies and Services, and that's 50 grand. Mm -hmm. Do we give them 50 grand or do we give them books? What do we, we give we them? We purchase supplies. They submit a list. The list is submitted to the county library who reviews that list for eligibility, and then the city makes the purchases. Okay, so they're, get, they're actually getting supplies. It's not a $50,000 check. That is okay. correct. Okay. That out of team librarian deferred maintenance, family place programs throughout the county library system. All right, I okay. All right, so I can live with that. All right. Let's talk about the five hundred thousand dollars. It was interesting when the library subcommittee recommended. You guys really didn't do any vetting of this organization, did you? No, there were no financials, there were no nothing, but I, I mean, we had to go dig those up. So how, how did it get this far without somebody taking a look at all that stuff? Is a question. Uh, do you want to do all of your questions and then get answered? No, let's do one at a time. Now, one okay. at a time makes it easier for me. Go ahead. Okay. I see one hand raised. And I don't know if there are any others who want to speak to this. I can also well, just provide some context. Well, no, it's really Mikey and Karen. Those are oh. the two guys who were on the library subcommittee. I'm just one. I mean, I, when I when I got it, the first thing I did was go to Elizabeth and say, "Give me some financials, right?" I want to know who these people are. Where the, you guys didn't do what? I'm just wondering why that wasn't something you took a look at prior to sending it up to us. My motion was to bring it forward for discussion, which is what we're doing. Right, but you didn't know what you were bringing forward for discussion. I don't think, right? No financials, no nothing. 
I think we that's not true. Uh, I disagree. Uh, we did have a hand up. So uh, uh, Laura Rosenthal was going to answer or comment on that no, no, question. No, 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 no. This is not nothing to do with Laura Rosenthal. OK, Steve, I did ask if you wanted to address these one by one or wait until you were done with all of your questions. So we can wait till all the questions are done. No, I'm wondering if, you, if, if Laura's going to respond to that question. Go ahead. But that this is not really directed toward her. This was trying to figure out how this thing got this far. If you look at those financials, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. This is not an organization that has demonstrated an ability to really get something done or to, or to give out a lot of money. Uh, so it, it seems to me that this is, you know, they're coming and saying, oh, I need I need money and I, I'm going to come to the city of Malibu. I'm going to ask for $500,000. I'm not going to give you any detail. Give me $500,000. I mean, that's a pretty... If there's a line I can get in to get the same thing, tell me where that line starts because I want to get there. Uh, so I've got some real, you know, and okay, so that was that. Second thing is you take a look and say, what is the benefit to the city of Malibu if we give out this $500,000? What do we get for it? Anybody? Okay, I'll ask you again. Or do you want me to make note of your questions and we'll wait till the end, or do you want to go one by one? Let's do one by one. What do okay. we if we do? Okay, so I think we should back up to the first question, have Laura address that, and then I'd be happy to address this question. Cool. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, Andrea couldn't be here tonight um, to answer some of these questions. So she asked me to fill in, and I can also ask our um, other board members to fill in some things that I might not know since uh, our current chair was our previous treasurer. Um, the financials were all provided to the subcommittee as, uh, as well as the council. You can see our financials for the last few years, our budget, everything that we've paid out, the things that we're uh, spending money on. So I guess I'm a bit confused, Steve, if you had some specific questions, but the organization has been around, um, and don't quote me on this, I think since 1982, but it really was not very active until we were able to hire a, an executive director through the library uh, set aside funds of Malibu. And since that time, we've really been able to to raise a lot more money and be self-supporting. When we asked um, the, the uh, county librarian, Sky Patrick, what the library really needed, she said, we need an, the foundation, which is the separate entity, to have an endowment so that we, then we can start raising a lot more money and be able to support all of the county libraries. The city of LA County, uh, the city of LA library system, I think, I, be, uh, I can't remember, but I think they have somewhere around a $16 million endowment. All of the large library systems that would compare to ours, the foundations that support them all have very large endowments. So we are asking the other cities to give the 3% that we're asking Malibu to give of the set aside funds. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna go into it now, but if you want some more information about the history, um, now, I'm the, also available. Now the question was, and, and could act, as soon as I saw the staff report, I got a hold of uh, Liz Shelverson and asked her if she had financials and she didn't have any. She had to go to your executive director, I guess, and get funding. So we did not get, I, I don't believe the, the library committee got them uh, because if she, if they had them, Liz would have had them also. Uh, we wouldn't have to go back and ask for a new set of those. So I don't know what, you know, I hear what you say, but I don't think that's accurate. So what, about, is this, what does this do for Malibu? If we give this money, what does this do for the Malibu residents? Because this is their money. What did they absolutely. get out of it? The, the same thing that that they're getting out of our the uh, funding the executive director we don't you know we're 
We're, we have an abundance of riches in Malibu in many ways, and the library set aside funds six, over $16 million at the end of this fiscal year um, it is, as I said, an, an abundance of riches. So I think that we don't live in a vacuum. We are able to have a lot of things at our library, like extended hours and programs, that it would benefit our residents if the um, communities that we interact with and the people, the people that come and visit us, the people that work here, the people whose um, kids go to school here, that it would benefit all of us to have well-educated um, communities that surround us in LA County. And, and, you, and you, want Malibu to, you want Malibu to fund all that? No, I'm not saying all of that. I'm saying to give the seed money to start an endowment. Okay. It's 3% of the $16.6 .6 million. Right. And I, we, we really don't, I mean, we, we certainly have ways that we can spend it in Malibu, but I think when you, you know, what's the expression, when you raise up one, you raise up all. And the other, the other county libraries don't have extended hours as we do. They don't have uh, a teen librarian. They don't have special collections. They don't have a lot of things. Right, but we're um, paying with that of our, our own tax money. That's our own tax money is paying for that. Correct. Right, so, um, you know, it's not like we're going someplace else and asking them to do that. Uh, I'm sorry. Look, I Okay, I, 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 I think we need to uh, get back to a, a meeting format and not just a, an open discussion. Well, that, that I know was, you had that, other questions, I, and I'm sorry I've forgotten. It seemed like there was another one, and I, I don't know if you remember what it was. Well, I, I mean, you know, the, the, the question is, we gave, we gave $300,000 to the Library Foundation a couple of years ago. So we've made our contribution. My sense is, look, we've got this this list of projects we want to get done that aren't done all right so we if, if we if we're going to spend the money let's spend it on the residents in Malibu who that's that's their money so I would I would I would vote against this okay uh I don't see any reason to take our funds and give them to somebody outside we don't know who's on this board we don't know what they're going to do we don't know anything about these folks well, we they wouldn't give us financials when we should have them so everybody could have understood what was going on so I'm going to vote no. I don't think it's the right thing to do with Malibu, the, the money from Malibu. Okay, thank you. I don't believe we're at the point of having a motion yet. Uh, Mikey, would you like to address this? Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, I appreciate all the speakers on both sides. You know, what I think about right now, and, and we're talking about the endowment, um, I think there doesn't seem to be much disagreement on any of the other um, any of the other expenses, which are actually more than the endowment. Um, I think about growing up in Malibu, and I think about my mom. Sorry to get personal for a second. She was the most voracious reader I've ever heard of or ever known. She was at the Malibu Library once a week, picked up like between seven and eight books. She'd read a book a day. She was that person. And what I'm reminded of is when she passed away, she had written a specific note that she wanted her books to go to the library system. Malibu got about 800. I brought them myself. And then I don't know where the other ones are. I don't remember, but they're inner city and they're all mysteries. She was a big fan of mysteries and she wanted kids in the inner city to have the experience she did and how much she loved mysteries. So I brought 2,000 mysteries into town. 2,000. God, they were heavy. Um, I don't know. That's my memory. Um, I, I get what the foundation's doing. And um, I, yeah, it is Malibu's money. And Malibu, it's true. It's Malibu's money and it needs to make an impact. And Maybe a Western library will happen someday. I don't think the library system seems to support it much if you're doing your research, but still um, there's that, but I would support, I would support the entire 
motion on this, including the Boys and Girls Club and the high school and all the other expenses that we've done previously. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mikey. Um, I, I will start out by correcting um, something that's been said a couple of times tonight um, that uh, the uh, needs assessment determination was that there would be a library built in Western Malibu. That's not what the needs assessment said. It said that there would be library services in Western Malibu. So let's be clear on that, that somehow that, that got twisted. Um, there have been some very uh, misguided statements made tonight, in my opinion, that LA County had been stealing Malibu's money. My understanding is that um, these excess funds were discovered and now they are held as set aside funds by the county. Um, they are county funds. They are generated by uh, Malibu uh, uh, tax dollar, ta tax revenue. So, you know, we're, we're kind of twisting words here. Um, I want to say that also the $300,000 that was given as seed money to hire an executive director and the other costs associated with the library foundation now have turned into a self-supporting system uh, that is generating more than that and paying that, that, that director's salary. So that, in my opinion, was money well spent. Um, I want to point out something I looked at uh, recently, and this is from the uh, World Population Review regarding worldwide literacy rates. The U.S. ranks 36th in literacy. Who's above us? I'll name a few countries. Poland, Russia, Armenia, Ukraine, Slovakia, Hungary, Italy, and others. And let's acknowledge the obvious. Poverty and illiteracy go hand in hand. And LA County is no exception. We are in a unique position to affect the greater good with our excess funds generated here in Malibu. Things that happen in the country affect us. We don't exist in a bubble here. And as was stated earlier, people who work for the city, people who work in the city, people who do business in the city, come from other parts of LA County and use that library system. And the old library model of somebody walking in and checking out a book and walking out and bringing it back a few weeks later, that's from the 1950s. Libraries do a million other things now besides that. I have every reason to believe with an over $16 million surplus, it is not going to impoverish or deny the people of Malibu the benefits that they currently enjoy with the excess library funds. I move to approve the subcommittee's recommendation. Okay, let me just say one other thing. You are, you are recommending to give money to a group of people you have no idea what they're going to do with that money. You have no idea. And that to me is, is irresponsible in dealing with the tax dollars raised by the Malibu residents. That's okay. our job. Our job is to be financially responsible. All right. And As was stated, Steve, to yeah. set up an endowment fund and all the reasons that are in the staff report and everything that we heard tonight, I do want to make a correction to something that Laura Rosenthal said. She mentioned the um, city of Los Angeles public library endowment. I think she said it was $16 million. It's actually $41 million. Uh, the city of Chicago public library endowment, almost $18 million. Okay. We yeah. live in a world-class county. And right. I believe I believe that the thing to do to improve the greater good, which will also improve things in Malibu, is to do this endowment and let this fund generate God knows how much money over the coming years, which will come back to benefit us. How's it gonna come back to benefit us? Steve, I just explained it. I don't need no, to say it all over again. No, no, no. Thank look. you. I've made my motion. Do we have a second? 
I'll second the motion. Roll call, please. May I'm sorry. I just wanted to just for clarification, um, the subcommittee's recommendation um, regarding the foundation was that council discuss it. If if that is your motion, then then that is your motion. I just wanted to make sure that that was in fact the motion you were trying to make right now. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. Yes, we have discussed it. And uh, my motion is to move the staff recommendation of the funds as they are out uh, laid out here in the staff report. Including the endowment request. The endowment request and all of the other uh, line items as presented. The Boys and, and Girls Club, local? Malibu High School and our local library. And you're ready for that roll call? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Uring? No. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, it is now 1015 and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, staff. Thank you, everybody. Good night, all. Thank you. Good night.